Viewer discretion is advised. We love words, but then we can't say the words that we need to say to be able to vocalize the fact that someone, if I'm going to be honest, someone fucking raped me. Mandate. Welcome to Mandate, where we navigate fresh perspectives and nothing is off the table. Tonight's guest is from Damaki Makoto, originally from West Okelani. Yes. It's all good, but um, uh, very soon she'll be relocating to Australia. She is an amazing, amazing wahine tour, or should I say a tahine uh, tour. And so, um, ladies, she's, she's been on, on the, you know, she's a broadcaster, she's been on a radio host. And so she's um, that familiar voice, that uh, recognisable voice that you hear on New FM on the Pacific Breakfast Morning Show. Um, also, she's um, been with PMN. Pacific Media Network um, since 2012 and also she's also been on um, New FM and also on the Pacific Radio News and so but she's more than that she's an amazing amazing lady who's an amazing mother of two with an amazing story to share please put your hands together for the incredible Agnes aka Aggie Tupo I've never had an applause like that before <laughs> Hey, Agnes, thank you so much for coming on tonight. It's, um, just, it's a privilege because I know this, this, you're on the other side now. You, you're the one who's always interviewing people and, and talking and having the talent with people. But I think um, just to start the ball rolling, because I just want to, I think just straight out the guts, um, Agnes, because ABC, when we're listening to ABC, the Australian Broadcasting Corporation, mm -hmm. tell us how everything unfolded because it's been, I know it's been a crazy few months for you. Um, so please, from, from, from your, your words and your own mouth, please tell us what has happened and how has this impacted you at this time and in this moment? Ooh, okay. Thanks. Uh, but <laughs> um, gosh, how do I do it? I have to roll back to February. That's really just where this whole story started because uh, I went with my kids. We went to a wedding that happened in Melbourne. And, you know, you look at the land and you think, well, oh, this is really nice. It is like a bigger version of Auckland. Um, but man, it's bougie, it's beautiful, it's the art, um, the landscape, just, yeah, it's, it's amazing. So from that, we came home and I just remember saying to the kids, what do you think? Do you think we could ever do a Melbourne? And my kids were very much just on board. They were like, yeah, let's go, mum. And I'm like, yeah, but let's go where? Like, we, I, I'm very much a person, I don't think I... I mean, I love to be adventurous sometimes, but I know that... Uh, Going over to Melbourne was, I needed something to go to. I didn't want to go over there and, and you know, their version of our uh, wins over here is Centrelink. I don't want to be going from, and just to go and get on the benefit and then just start somewhere. So I just remember um, Betty just saying, I came home, we came back to New Zealand and um, honestly, I just sat in my room and I just said, man, God, wouldn't it be cool if, uh, if we went over there? that what I'm doing right now, that there would be a job like that over in Australia. And that literally is my words. And so life carried on, you know, the work that I do. And I absolutely love my job here. I think probably two months later, um, I get an Instagram, uh, you know, message. And uh, I looked at and went, you know, and then the way it was worded it was just like, hi, I'm this person. Um, I would love to contact you. I'm from ABC. And I just was like, is this a scam? Like, uh, yeah, so, you know, because there's been so many scams that have happened on, on social media. And then so I thought, OK, well, let's just check it out. So I called her, we did a Zoom, and honestly, just everything that I had said back in February was literally just being poured out on, in front of me. And I was like, God, you're funny. Like, honestly, you're too funny because, <clears throat> excuse me, I mean, I don't know. It's one of those things I know as a woman of faith. I, I absolutely believe God is a God of, you know, like miracles and he can do all of these things. But it just, I think sometimes when you think it actually is happening, I was just like, okay, let me just think about this. But yeah, honestly, roller coaster from the moment we called and she offered the job and said, hey, would you want to do what, what I'm doing right now over there in Australia? And it has just been the last two months of me saying yes. I just, I just said yes. Yeah, I don't know if you've seen that movie, right, where you just say yes yeah. to everything, right? And you just do it. And I honestly have been in this phase where I'm just saying yes to a lot of things um, and taking it on board because, well, hey, I'm not getting any younger. Um, and the struggle is real here in Aotearoa. Mm. Um, and, you know, is the money attractive? Absolutely. Mm. Like, I'm not going to lie. It's me trying to think about how I can do better for my children um, and, and put them in spaces where... I have now been afforded and um, I'm leaving on Sunday 
right now. You know, I've been offered the, a, a role to be a presenter for a show called The Pacific Beat. And I've been doing The Pacific Morning. So it just is weird how it's changed. It'll be obviously in the land of kangaroos and koalas and, and whatnot now and snakes. And I really hope that none of them ever come up my toilets or anything because that's all I keep hearing. But, you know, uh, if anything, that is just how it went. It was just like from asking and saying something really would probably often look as quite flippant, a comment that I was just saying to God, like, oh, wouldn't it be cool? To him just opening that door. And I do tell people, honestly, it's like him. He has parted the Red Sea. It literally feels like he's parted the Red Sea so that I can walk through with my kids unscathed and get to the other side so that uh, we can obviously live out our dreams. Yeah, yeah that's, that's beautiful. So, yeah, so that's pretty much yeah. it in a nutshell. Yeah. 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 yeah, congratulations. Man, congratulations. That's congratulations. awesome. Thank you. That's massive. Are you <clears throat> anticipating... Um, because you've been in the thick of um, our Pacifica people, mm. being the voice, interviewing them, helping them kind of get their stuff across the waves. Are you expecting something different when you go over there? Like, are you expecting a different kind of Pacifica? Like, what yeah. are you anticipating? Uh, I feel like we are totally different mm. in the way that we've viewed Pacifica here in New Zealand versus how Australians view Pacifica. And that's not a bad thing. It is obviously just how it's been. Um, we are very much more Polynesia orientated over here. Australia is more Melanesian, Micronesian. That's their take on, of course, you know, the indigenous would be, of course, their people, the Aborigines, and then the Torres Strait Islanders. Mm. That is their take on what we would say would be Pacific. Um, and it's a different world because, yeah, we are more concentrated on Polynesia. Um, Oh. The role that I sit in, though, of course, I am still advocating for all stories for our Pacific people, but it just is now a greater platform, which includes Micronesia and Melanesia. Mm -hmm. And so I will be learning a whole lot more about tapping into that field. Um, yeah, so it's going to be different. Um, look, my work team, we're <laughs> when they see this, <laughs> um, <clears throat> it's that whole thing of like, yeah, there's different shades of brown is all I can say, but it's a lighter shade of brown over there, <laughs> you know? And so yeah. for them to have to um, seek outside of Australia, to have to find Pacific people to come and do their shows, uh, one is very humbling. I'm grateful for it, but it's sad that there is actually a small pool of people or Pacific people that are not in that space mm -hmm. to be able to be journalists and broadcasters and presenters and things like that. They don't have that many. Yeah. If any, wow. <laughs> so oh, you're going to yeah. be awesome there because you're going to be somebody who's quite grounded. Thanks. You know, yeah. uh, quite quite gr grounded. Um, and when you go over there, you're going to bring that substance that I think they're looking for. Mm. And for uh, and I like how you've described them: lighter shade of brown. Yeah. Um, yeah. And it's not literal, eh? <laughs> <clears throat> uh, to, to a certain extent, <laughs> to a certain extent. But yeah. look, don't get me wrong. Whether it's a lighter shade of brown. Those people are, are massive advocates for our Pacific stories. Yeah. So I have to give it up to them that yeah. there are people who are Bālangi Australian, you know, who have who are going out to the islands, and that's them changing their lives, living in a place that they're not used to, and having to tell our stories. So I still have to give them kudos for wanting to tell our stories, because I know we have this whole thing about for us by us that whole thing, right? Like a story that's about our Pacific people should only be told by us, um, and I'm all for that. But the thing is, if there is no one in that space, but if they are doing it and they're getting like, you know, correct information, are being guided properly, then then why not? You know, because there was a time where no one was telling our stories. And so I, I, for me, I just sort of sit in a space where it's just like we should just welcome it and embrace if there are people who are telling our stories. And then if you are the person who may know the knowledge about your people, then all you need to do is just guide them, mm. right? It doesn't have to be a thing where you're lording it over them like, I'm the only one <laughs> that knows my people. And, you know, like, sometimes I just feel like we stretch that too far where it's just like, come on, guys. Like, if they're gifted in that art, allow them to do what they're doing. And if they're doing it for us, then we should embrace it. Mm. Yeah, That's cool. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah. It's awesome. Because I guess our journey here as um, Pacifico have come from – I guess first generation with our parents mm. coming here, we've had to mould these two worlds. Yeah, it's totally different over there, eh? Um, it's a little different. <laughs> yeah, totally different, and I can kind of see some of that. But I, I, what I've also heard is like when some of our bus speaker go over there, they're doing amazing stuff. When they bring stuff, people are hungry for it. Yeah. And so to have someone who's going to hold that space, 
and the airwaves and then the media space I think is exciting, yeah. really exciting. I'm excited, I'm excited. You guys have to understand that lot of the, the life that I grew up on, talk to my family, they probably just will crack up because um, I grew up, you know, as much as I'm now an advocate for Pacific people, the whole thing about for us, by us, yes. But man, I grew up very much not wanting to be an islander. I hated being really? Tongan. I hated being an islander. I, I grew up in a very multicultural area, which is West Auckland, Te Aratu. Oh. Uh, Te Aratu in the 80s, <laughs> there hardly were, that Te Aratu South, uh, there were hardly any islanders yeah. in that area. Uh, I remember being the only Tongan at my school amongst Cook Islanders, Samoans, a lot of Māori, um, Asian and Balangi. So to be the only Islander, I, yeah, and then growing up, again, I don't, <laughs> I've shared the story before, I don't even want to paint that I grew up in my, you know, my parents' church, beautiful, you know, they gave me the knowledge about God and all of that stuff, but I grew up seeing that the only thing about church was that it was all about fight, love, love, it's all about just money, it was all about giving everything to the church, and then um, us being at home and just eating I don't know, mm. bread, you know, like, so for me, that just was my view. It became my view. And I thought, if this is what it's like to be an Islander, I don't want to mm. be one. So I tried to exercise so much about having to be really good at English and being able to become very eloquent and very much sound like a palangi. So now, I mean, people hear me now and they're just like, man, you're a fob. Like, do you know, like, I mean, I've just grown up, obviously, you know, I've loved English all my life, and I think the art of learning English and what it comes with it, um, like I used it to the point where I thought I was better than anyone else, but that was really bad. That, do you know what I mean? Like I really used it. That was, it, was, it was wrong. Um, yeah, I had to change a lot of things about my life and stuff. So growing up, now understanding, I did not want to learn how to speak Tongan or Samoan. It wasn't until I was humbled very much when I went to the islands and I wasn't able to um, converse with the elders. I mean, I know I could have done it here. <clears throat> a funeral happened, one of our nanas passed away. And uh, yeah, gosh, they just taught me the, um, the art of the village and being able to converse. And ever since then, I made it mandatory that I would be able to speak Tongan by the time I was um, 21. Mm -hmm. So I went to Donga when I was 18. So I gave mm -hmm. myself... And the best way that I learned how to speak Tongan uh, was reading the Bible in Tongan. I literally had to con just read that over and over and over. Wow. Uh, not for the sake of having to try and <laughs> build a relationship with Jesus. That wasn't how it was. It was purely because it was the most Tongan thing I could have. That was everything was in Tongan. And so, yeah, I feel like I'm a whole lot more fluent. Like I speak more fluent Tongan now. Very proud to be Tongan. Very proud to be Samoan. But I must tell you, uh, my view of being a Pacific person growing up was uh, quite, um, yeah, it was bad. Oh. Yeah, it was really wow. bad. It's, yeah. it's interesting, um, Agnes, in terms of like full circle, like you saying, oh yeah. man, I just don't want anything to do with my Pacific people, my ethnicity. And then yeah. you look at it now, you end up working with New FM, Pacific, yeah, the yeah. Pacific Radio News and all that. And then yeah. you get to go to ABC and they want you to come to be in the Pacific um Radio yeah. stations, like, what, what, so it's just amazing. Yeah, I do. I feel like it is a full circle. I feel like God has just honestly interrupted my life and just everything that he's done with me has always been that it's been flipped. Um, everything that I thought was what it was, um, he has just shown me, just like, yeah, no, no, no. <laughs> uh, you've got it wrong there, girl. Um, but yeah, I do, and that's the thing. I'm, I, I suppose when we know we have our Pacific languages and whatnot here in Aotearoa, I honestly stand by it because I feel like there is no other country in the world that would advocate for us to for our languages in another country other than our motherland. Mm. And that's something here in Aotearoa that I know nowhere else in the world would, would afford that or would even go out of their way to acknowledge who we are as people here in this land. Um, yeah, so I'm all for language. I'm all for Pacific. I'm, and I'm just amazed that I still have to, I can carry on that journey over in Aussie. Um, yeah. And hopefully bring something to the table, you know. Yeah, that's amazing. <laughs> well, wait, just one thing as well, um, Agnes, because you, you talk about your, your earlier childhood in terms of growing up as, as Dongan and Samoan mm. and Te Aratu South. But can you elaborate a little bit more in terms of your, your upbringing? Yeah? Obviously, uh, being Pacific, but also yeah. kind of some of the things that you kind of underwent and kind of kind of witnessed or experienced mm. growing up, and also some of the hardships. Because I know you you've gone oh, through some. I know you've yeah. gone through some 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 stuff. And yeah. it would be kind of, kind of be cool to hear from, from, from yourself and, and your own words in terms yeah. of some of the stuff that you, went under, uh, you underwent. 
Who? Where do I start? Is this therapy now? <laughs> Is this a counselling session? Because I feel like. Uh, <laughs> Oh, we might not have anything to um, help you with your th- <laughs> with your trauma. <laughs> I'm playing nah, trauma. I'm no, I'm I'm a trauma. Psychologist, I'm psychologist. Be careful, man. She yeah. might. Oh, I'm the, uh, <laughs> She's a professional interviewer. She might just flip this. Yeah, true. <laughs> so I'm just, going yeah. Back. just meet me. Just meet me. <laughs> yeah, I'm trying to rein I'm it in and quiet. not turn it around and ask you guys questions. She's holding the chair. Yeah. Look at her. <laughs> Uh, Oh gosh, look, okay, so I am the youngest of 12 children uh, And that is because my father is a pimp No, 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 no No, No, he obviously was married first You know, had his first lot of children And then his first wife passed away uh, And then he met my mother And then obviously had the rest of us Where do you sit? Uh, I am the youngest Oh, The youngest, yeah So very much feel like I did get spoiled uh, growing up I honestly don't remember doing many fat hours because my mother would do everything. Mm. Um, so, you know, being a sport child means you act spoiled. And uh, unfortunately, I think that's where, you know, uh, when I spoke about the wanting to be fia balangi and just, you know, was because I thought I was thou art better than, than others. Um, and honestly, that is the honest truth. I think just because I was spoiled. And that's I don't put that on my mum and dad. Um, it's just I think because her last two lot of kids were born here in New Zealand. Everyone else was born in Tonga. So only two kids that were born here. Um, grew up in West Auckland. Uh, and yeah, you uh, Aggie experienced a couple of things throughout her life. And uh, yeah, if I were going to do therapy and, and, and counselling tonight, um, a lot of people do already know my story. Uh, the whole lot of more people are gonna know, but um, and I and I was always open on ear. This is the greatest thing I felt when God has obviously you know the mess that you've gone through in life. He's allowed me to use that on ear with work, and I was uh, always able to be vulnerable enough to share my story because I knew there would be someone else out there that's gone through the same thing. So unfortunately, yes, Aggie was um, actually sexually abused when I was little um, by quite a few people. And because of that, the story of Aggie became uh, somebody else's. Uh, What happened to me was not fear, but uh, to this day, um, it was not fear, but now, uh, you know, my healing is my responsibility. And I've been able to walk out a lot of things and been able to forgive and, um, yeah, forgive those people, you know, and, um, yeah, it was hard. I... I, talk, I spoke about this at my farewell, guys. Sorry, um, I've got my story all over the place. But my thing is, I um, yeah, I ended up putting on masks. So I was very much a person who tried to be whatever anyone wanted me to be. Um, and I feel like I've become that person. So I felt because they took my innocence, I I didn't know how to be me. Because I thought, because they took me. That's how I looked at it, as they took me of how God created me, and then now I was just like, I don't even know who to be anymore. So you know, growing up obviously became very promiscuous. You know, going out with anybody and everybody. Um, high school was hard. High school was hard because I think I was very much uh, a wannabe. I just wanted to fit in. So I became tried to become real tough. Um, thought I was Tupac's daughter, and <laughs> back in the nineties, you know, and would wear the bandana tied up at the front, you know, <laughs> and be with my and you know this. The funny thing is because I have older siblings, they have kids that are my age, so I would go and hang with them, and we were oh my gosh, we would run amok, you know, and um, it just man, yeah, I was so fake. It's not even funny, and it, it just because of the hurt and the trauma of what had happened to me, I. I didn't know who I was, and that took me a long time. It wasn't until maybe, and then, you know, because of that, hello, at the age of 20, I became pregnant, you know, I met somebody, I had my son, um, and my mum, I had him a month before my 21st, my mum's like, yeah, that is your 21st key right there, you know? (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, you know, so she was like, yeah, voila, (laughs) you want your 21st, there it is, and so I was like, okay. Um, but yeah, so that was it. It was, you know, now that I became a, a single mum, that was the hard part because everyone knew that I was getting ready to get married uh, to my son's father. 
Um, and <laughs> if you want to know that story, <laughs> I got mean stories. I, I hope you're watching. <laughs> <laughs> Oh no, it's not a name and shame. Uh, but yeah, you work for the police force now, so I. <laughs> <laughs> no, nah, you can edit that out. <laughs> what no. station now? <laughs> um, yeah, that was unfortunate part. Like so, I, so. I, if I bring it back, the whole thing of being a, wearing a mask and, and just pretending to be somebody else because I didn't know who I was, is just really the way how I viewed men too. It was a very warped way of how I viewed men. I thought the only way to get into a relationship was to give it up to anybody. Whoever showed a little bit of interest, Aggie decided to be that promiscuous little girl and um, yeah, whatever they wanted, Aggie was more than happy to oblige because... Yeah, I, don't, I just yeah, I just had a very warped view of of men, and thought the only way to get them was just to go and sleep with them, um, and that obviously happened with my son's father. And the unfortunate part of that was just yeah, gosh, we were together. I thought I was gonna get married to him, like I thought this was it. <sighs> yeah, it was hard. Um, and then I went to America because my parents sent me off to America because, uh, you know, I was about to marry a five year old son, so you know, with a commoners at church so we don't have that much money so you know it's trying to level up to what they're going to present if you know what I mean yeah. you know so if you're going to be marrying a five-year-old son you better come with the goods so I was sent off to the states uh, my sister took me in <laughs> and if you've gone to uh, Tongan five others you know that's uh, you're the girl in the middle that serves the other and that is what I did to make money and I made a bit of money and I came back and then unfortunately um on the week of the wedding, uh, you know how you're meant to go and register like mm -hmm. a couple of days before mm -hmm. the actual day? Yeah, everything was fine, like, um, let me tell you, everything was set. Um, but he never showed up. So uh, on the week of the wedding, uh, the dude decided to go and marry someone else. And so, yeah, unfortunately, that's how it ended. And so I ended up being a single mum and, you know, now I have my son. And, yeah, that was that, was that part of my life. And I just thought, wow. That's not how I was thinking life was going to be. And then going from there, not till eight years later, look at me, I've got um, my daughter. Eight years later, I met another guy, and unfortunately that didn't work out too. So I have had to learn a lot of lessons, even in my age now. Now that I'm in my 40s, um, I have, it has taken a long time for me to understand my worth. It's taken me a long time for me to understand who I am. And only maybe in the last five to five years have I really understood who Aggie is and that she is all right with who she is. Yeah, but it's taken a very long time. So childhood was a little bit hard. Um, yeah, because of the hurt and all of that that happened, I became really hardened, really angry, mad at the world, mad at my parents, mad at my siblings, just mad at anybody. Um, if you probably see a lot of photos when I was in my teenagers, <laughs> half of them are like this, <laughs> like just not smiling, just very angry and just wanted to be a gay, like felt like being a gangster was <coughs> the thing in the nineties. Um, but what an idiot. Like, honestly, I look back and think, what an egg, <laughs> what an egg. Um, but that just was how it was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know where else to go with my story, but it just, yeah. There's something about that hip hop culture. Oh you know, yeah. Going through it, like that would have been something you resonated with or the way you were able to express yourself. So mm. music has always been a thing. Mm. I know what it is. Growing up with my two um, my two older siblings from uh, my mum and dad's marriage, uh, heavily involved in breakdancing mm. back in the day, you know, B-boys, all of that stuff. I used to go and watch my brother do that. And then he would have the cardboard at home, you know, flip around, do your windmills, <laughs> yeah. all of that, the L kicks, you know. I would watch that and be enamoured so much. It's just like, it was just such a, a great era of music, mm. like coming out of 70s, 80s, 90s, um, hip hop was something that resonated to me. So I would go out of my way, like your tape decks at the back <laughs> and tape every song on the radio. You know, obviously my FM was the chosen <laughs> yeah. station back then. Um, yeah, it was the it was the V Shane show back then. Remember when yeah, V Shane yeah, v was Shane, the yeah, host on, um, <laughs> Mike on Mike Haru, Mike Haru, yeah, yeah, yeah. Hayden Hare, like yeah, just sorry, just guys, all this. Oh, this before my oh, time. Oh, this before my time. Okay, sorry, yeah, yeah, I'm really old. Uh, 
<laughs> but that's what I mean. It oh. was that era where, man, I loved music. And so I would go mm. out of my way and buy empty tapes just so I can tape mm. all the songs. VHS, I would have all the videos at home. <laughs> I would be watching RTR, yeah. like Countdown with, you know, yeah. Robbie Rackety. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, I would be there and I would be talking with my friends on the phone and we'd be battling, you know, songs and who's, who's videoing this and have you heard this song? So music became very much an escape. Um, but at the same time, hip hop man back then was, whoo, um, yeah, American hip hop, of course, that would have mm. came through, right? Um, heavily influenced by Biggie, Tupac, um, Dr. Dre. Um, yeah, there was a lot that I had just sat and would listen to their music. Uh, when obviously Missy Elliott came through, I was very much a big fan of Queen Latifah. Like music yeah. was such a man. We can love. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I heavily Motown era uh, is mm. heavy in our family, but we grew up on um, <laughs> we grew up heaps on country music. Like you know, my my parents were a big massive. You mm. know, the one thing I, I think the beautiful thing I do remember about my parents' marriage is them always um, dancing and waltzing mm. together in the lounge. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was a beautiful yeah, thing yeah, to watch, and my yeah. dad would always put me on his feet and you know waltz with me in the lounge. Yeah, those were just beautiful memories. I mean, Tammy Wynette was the soundtrack to mm. you know my parents, Kenny Rogers, mm. um, Dolly Parton. Yeah. You know, yeah. There's just so much, so I could just yeah, go yeah, on and yeah. on about music because. It did play a part in my life because um, I believe because of the creativity that God had given me, um, I loved um, listening to lyrics and lyrics would speak heavily to yeah. me. And obviously uh, as a creative person, you're often a, quite an emotional person too. So man, you'd be in your fields with the 90s music when there was all boy bands, when Boys to Men came through, mm. you know, in sync. <laughs> uh, <Yeah. laughs> you know, Shy, you've yeah, got, you know, shy, all the boys yeah. group, you know, High mm. Five, High Jodeci, uh, yeah. Jodeci and all of that. Yeah, oh. like, let me tell you, that was <laughs> the soppy ass music in the background because you're being broken hearted over no one, you're not even in a relationship. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, that was me. It was like all these, all these songs and their lyrics are like, resonated with me but I'm like you don't even have a boyfriend <laughs> so why are you getting so cut up about these songs but yeah yeah that's cool and I'm just because you know you're going through your high school your high school years and just lost in terms of your identity mm. and then even you know you turn up for your wedding day like <laughs> and I know you fast tracked it fast track to eight years after that yeah but like do you remember that time in your life, like how you're feeling, or oh gosh, what some of what are some of the things that you're like expressing, or like mm. how are you expressing yourself? Like, is it, are you going on like actually all cutted up in your blue and <laughs> looking for trouble, or like? <laughs> I think, gosh, when the when the wedding didn't go through, look, I mean, you know, it's like hindsight. Yeah. Now you understand, yeah. totally understand. Yeah, yeah. Uh, like I said, for hindsight is a bitch, like <laughs> literally. And you know, you wish you knew what you knew yeah. back then. But hey, look, that's what I went through. Um, I would say, um, what did I want to do? Gosh, I just wanted to drink. Just wanted mm. to all because I was. Uh, when was I about to get married? I was yeah twenty. You know, I thought I was ready for the world. I was going to get married, going to live the um, happy white picket, you know, got a family, got a house. Like we went out of our way to get a house before we got married and all that. We were going to live with my mum, all that stuff. And then, you know, it, it didn't turn out that way. And then it was just like, I think what I was so broken hearted over, not just because of the fact that I didn't get married, it was the, you could have just told me, mm. you know, why, why could you not have just said, hey, I don't want to get married, uh, you know. For me, that was that whole thing of being, like they say, left at the altar, right? No explanation, no nothing. And it's the no explanation to this day. We oh, are no, here. You're kidding me. And my son is 22 years old and he's never seen his father. You know, it's one of those things where it's just like, okay, cool. If you're going through some stuff, you know, if you went through shit, if you didn't want to get married, uh, for me, it was like, cool, you can hurt me. But, you know, for the sake of our boy, mm. it was one of those things like, yeah, that, that was tough. It was tough mm. to have to deal with someone who could not have just been honest enough to have said, don't want to do it. Mm. Um, yeah, so, th so that was, that was gut-wrenching. And what was gut-wrenching was also that it was one of those things where my there were quite a few people in my family that said, you know, don't get married. Mm. 
but you know, mm. here I am, all in my feels, because I'm thinking this is it. Um, you know, no one would ever do that to me. You know, no one would leave me. Um, <laughs> you know why I even thought that, but you know, um, and when it did happen, it was just like, shit, there must be something wrong with me. Like I think if anything, it just then turned its ugly head into the, this is why I don't know who I am because I'm just too busy trying to be whatever for anybody else. Um, yeah, it was hard. It was really mm. hard to to navigate and it was even harder because when my family said that they didn't want me to get married, is that my oldest brother came all the way from Hawaii to surprise me for the wedding. Mm. And damn, you know when I opened that door? Do you know what it was? It was just, <clears throat> whoo! <laughs> uh, yeah, I felt like I disappointed my family again. And uh, I had been doing that for quite a bit throughout my whole childhood and, um, and teenager life of um, constantly mucking up. And I think when you're used to mucking up all the time, you just think, yeah, you're, you're not good for, you know, you, what's the point of living? Uh, and I think from there many times, the thoughts of having to commit suicide, the thoughts of having to no longer be around, Mm. Uh, played on my mind a lot. I'm only crying because it just sort of takes me yeah, back, but yeah, I'm not. Yeah. Uh, yeah, not, even, yeah. not even there anymore, guys. Just know <laughs> that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I love my life. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and that, that's the story you created mm. during those times. Mm. And it's not that your family felt like that. It was just this is what you had to deal with, mm. and this is how you kind of just interpreted the world at that time. Yeah, and you can see how this adds to. You know the the, I guess just the the way you responded, mm. hey, the way mm. you responded, and it was just all you knew at the time, all you knew at the time. Yeah, they always say that you know that whole fight or flight. Mm. Yeah, I feel like a lot of times I became so used to uh, just fighting, but at the same time I would, the flight part was just that I would want to just run away. Mm. I'd run away from my issues and not have to deal with it, mm. which is why I'm very heavy on my kids now having to not be those people where they run away but they would run to me yeah as a parent as the parent you know yeah so that that we can talk about it um and that's nothing on my parents you know you know we all know your parents only knew what they knew yeah and so obviously they passed that on to us but you know now that we know better then we should be doing better mm. and so i feel like that's why i'm such a massive advocate for yeah. my kids now it's like don't run away from your issues face it and we face it together mm. yeah yeah it, it sounds like you've gone on this massive journey, <laughs> but it's, it also sounds like to me you've found you. Yeah. Oh, gosh. So who is you? <laughs> who is Aggie? I've had to ask myself that many times yeah. <laughs> uh, throughout my 40 years. Who am I? Uh, look, I know that I am fierce in, um, in who I am. Like, so to say that <laughs> means um, I'm loud, <laughs> but I can be very quiet at times, mm. right? Like I... I'm a lover of music, mm. but I'm a lover of reading, you know. I I care. I am eloquent. I'm beautiful. I am a mother, but at the same time, without being any of those titles, I am someone who is willing to speak on behalf of other people who will never, ever have the opportunity to speak. Yeah. And yeah. I feel like this is that thing. Like if you knew me at high school, you would never get me to do a three-minute speech. Mm -hmm. I would always be that child below. Like, I need to go toilet, miss, and never come back to the room. Uh, that's why I think a lot of my family look at me and go, that's not the Aggie that we grew up with. Um, so shy, so timid, but so angry. Um, the mere fact that I now host a show is like, what? Mm -hmm. <laughs> like that That's the thing. I, I have to keep reminding myself that it's just like... For me, as much as I keep telling people, yes, that's my talent, but honestly, it's hands down, it's God. Like I just, mm. that's how much I know that it's not me that's orchestrated this, like, right? Like I just feel like God has had His hand in my life the whole time, but I've just been too busy being angry and too busy being stubborn about the things that happened to me and not actually seeing what He brought me out of. Mm. Yeah, awesome. yeah. I love what you've just said um, that I advocate on behalf of people. And you know what it tells me? It tells me that all these experiences that you've had have, has given you a, I like to call it superpower. It's just, I like to call it a superpower. When people go through things, it does something to the way they are alerted 
to other people's spaces. Yeah. It's like you get it, mm. you know it, and you can sense it when it's there. Yeah. And then like <clears throat> like, you know, if with some of the stuff that we've done in the past, we've had to go on the radio to talk about what we do. And sure. I've noticed the way you interview, mm. it's real intuitive. Yeah. It's real yeah. connected. Yeah. Like you really understand why we're there. And that's special. Like that there is a special yes. gift. Um, and Thank that you. comes from your journey. That comes from your journey. That comes from what you've had to be through, uh, what you've had to go through, what you've had to um expose yourself to and then kind of go how do I make sense of this and so I love that that's one of your that's one of the characteristics that you have mm. is that you're able to advocate on behalf of people who can't speak up because no one they think no one else knows but you, you you'll pick that up I think that's cool special thank you I appreciate that I think when you yeah it's funny when you've gone through something you can immediately pick it up on other people yeah and I have had to learn to gear that in a way where, you know, um, you don't want to be intrusive of someone's story and whatnot. You want to make sure that you are still being sensitive because, you know, and I know that you guys would know it's that whole thing of not having to re-traumatise somebody, mm. right? And so for me, oh gosh, I've been re-traumatised 10 million <laughs> times over, you know, but at the same time, um, it is to a point where um, when I'm speaking on air, right, when I'm when I'm having to have that conversation with someone, I've I've just known that uh, someone someone said to me, you have a very empathetic approach, mm. but you're very direct. So for me, that's I think how I want to approach life is that um, someone is always going through something worse mm. than you have gone through. Mm. And for me, as as bad as I had seen my story, I know there's someone else that's currently fighting to live. Mm. Uh, there's someone else who's fighting to not be beat up again. There's someone else who's fighting to not be raped again someone else fighting not to think about committing suicide. Mm. So for me, I always have to approach that in a way when I'm talking to someone. It's because, you know, we always say that thing, you know, tell people to check in, check in, <laughs> you know, check in, all of that stuff and whatever. Mm. But I don't know, I get a little bit tired of the check in sometimes because for me, um, I'm just going <laughs> to say it. Gay, gay <laughs> um, often we have said check in too much to a point where um, it's just – what off. you post up on on mm. social media so everyone just wants to post it up and say check in with your mate but i'm uh, let me tell you i don't know how many people have said that to me they're just like you know um but i've never not once seen them check in mm. i think for me do, do you know what i mean it's yeah. just and not to i don't want to take it away from i know that we should check in on people yeah. and and ask for help if you're feeling down and out about about stuff in life but I just feel like we've become, so it's just become the word. But I, for me, it's become the word. My thing is become the person that you, do you know what I mean? It's that it whole, doesn't. if you want to be the change, uh, if you want to see change, then be the change. Like yeah. literally, please don't ask me to say that you want to catch up with coffee and I don't see you for the next two years. Mm. Like for me in life now, everything has to be intentional. Like if I want to catch up with you, then I will tell you. I won't do that. Hey, let's catch up and you know, five years later. I'm moving to Melbourne and I still haven't seen you. For me, I just, because I've, yeah, I feel like everything just gets, words get thrown out so easily now and we all copy what everybody else says. But my, do, if, <laughs> yeah. I get yeah. you. do you know what I mean? Yeah. Everyone just copies each other. It's just, it's just like, that's the word for the season. But I'm just like, don't wait for seasons. Just mm. be the season, yeah. mm. you know, and be the season from January to December. Don't wait for um, someone to say, okay, March is all about, let's advocate for cancer. And <laughs> November is all about, you know, just yeah. like, stop. Like, why yeah. do we, it just, we're, we're so caught yeah. up in stuff. We need to change, we need the the awareness to move into behaviour changing. Absolutely. And we that's, need the action yes. now. We Absolutely. need the action. So yeah. good. Yeah. It's almost like we're, like how we throw around, throw around the word I love you like we just well, say I love you yeah. I love you and becomes like just words yeah. there's no action behind it and, yeah. oh, and it's cool gosh. how you say even chicken there's chicken and so on but yeah. it's almost it's just it's just words now <laughs> it is and and we know that words are important so that's mm. for me very much I say to my kids you know your word is your bond mm. so please don't and you know, let me tell you the person that holds me to account on that is my daughter <laughs> she is very much a uh, a, a big advocate for, but you said, <laughs> but you said, mum, and I and I've 
I've failed her on so many occasions mm. on that. So for me, it's just like, well, yeah, I can't keep telling other people, but I'm not even doing it to my own children. So they very much hold me account to that. And so that's why I'm just like, stop just saying I love you. <laughs> but really, like, what does I love you look like to to you, mm. Etia? What does it look like to you? You know, like, I love you could mean that, um, yeah, I'll pick you up if you need to go to work on, on a Friday. But I love you would be the, but what if I'm homeless and I need a place to stay? Will you still love me? I don't know. Mm. Because me and my kids have been homeless and there were not many people that were able to take us in. But that, again, I'm not saying that in a very like, Ugh, you know, you guys suck. <laughs> you didn't help me out. It was just, those were my choices too. We became homeless because I was just going through shit. I was going through a broken, broken marriage. And so, yeah, there, there are a lot of things. Uh, there's one thing I do say to my kids uh, a lot of time, like, um, you know how in our island um, families, everyone is auntie and uncle, mm. you know, but uh, I have very much learned that you don't become auntie and uncle to my children until you, do you know what I mean? Mm. You sit in a space because we are so easily throw out like, oh, I've just yeah. met you, this is my friend, you're my auntie. But because let me tell you, there are many aunties and uncles that have done things to your children that, you know what I mean? Mm. You don't. You will never deserve that over my children. Like you have to, have to have been like part of our family. Like you are tight. Like you have invested into my kids. You know things like that. And so I don't say that in an arrogant way. I just say so it in good. a way because the protection of my children is the yeah. ultimate. Do you know yeah. what I mean? If anything ever happens to them, it's I would never want to have that conversation of, well, auntie did something to me or uncle did something mm. to me. So Goodness. I heavily place on them as that not everyone that comes into your life is your auntie and uncle immediately. Mm. Besides your immediate family, yeah. who is your mm. biological auntie and, yeah, yeah. and uncle and things like that. But yeah, there are things like this. So I'm very much big on words Good. and where and what you use them for. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and I, 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 I'm glad that you brought that up about the chickens. Mm. Um, be and I also, I'm glad that I'm also hearing that you're quite empathetic around why some people don't. Mm. And so I think, you know, why do people not? Like they say it all the time yeah. and they know they should. And then I think rubber hits the road and then they're like, eh. yeah. What, what, why do people not follow through with it? Because we all know we need to. Yes. Yeah. And you share this example of you being homeless and nobody reaches out. Like wh what stops people and how do we... If you have journeyed with someone maybe for a certain amount of time in life, people get to know you a certain way, right? So I suppose the moment you do something that's probably out of character or a little mm. bit different, people can be maybe a little bit either offended or taken aback. Scared. And then don't know. Yeah, scared and then don't know how to react mm. yeah. and how to respond, right? And my whole life I have always reacted to everything. Again, it took me a long time to learn how to respond. You know, because my reaction was real quick. I just, if you piss me off, mate, I just want to drop you. Like, <laughs> like that is because I was just angry. I was just like, you do me wrong, then the consequences that you're going to suffer. Mm. Like that is how I looked at life. Not until again, <laughs> having to understand, no, that's not probably the right way. Oh, look, there are certain moments. If someone's going to cross the road, you want to react quickly and grab <laughs> them, right? To save them from yeah. an oncoming car. But then if there are moments like, like my son's father who left me. My reaction was, where is a shotgun? Like, where can I, do you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, I just wanted to shoot you because it was like, how dare you? How dare you do cool. this? And then, but having to learn over the years is just learning to respond better mm -hmm. and be understanding of, okay, well, what was he going through? As yeah. much as I really didn't care back then. No, but do you know what I mean? Yeah, it's I just like, look, don't, don't get me wrong. It's because he's not the only person that's like failed in life. I have failed many a times in life. So to have to have me sit in comparison and compare our failures, that's not for me to judge and be the jury of. That's up to God. Yeah. yeah. Wow. That's powerful. Yeah. So, so you, you share a lot about um, God. Yeah. Like you, you've mentioned it a lot. Uh, are you able to tell us... The journey with God, like yeah, yeah, you look yeah. back and you understand that mm. He's been, He's orchestrated, yeah, a lot of things in your life. But um, was there a rock bottom moment where you? Because mm -hmm. you, you even talk about like you've had this bad experience with church. Yeah, well, see, this is the thing. <laughs> Gosh, we can understand. Um, <laughs> we all grew up in church, right? Mm. And we obviously realized that that is just a staple part of our Pacific culture. Yeah. 
So yeah, so I grew up in church. I got taught about God. And that was all it was, is I got taught about God. Um, and that to show up to church every day would somehow make you a Christian. Obviously, I grew up in a Christian church. Um, but uh, that's probably where it ended, right? I don't think I ever understood what it was to have a relationship, which is something that I learned later on in my years. So I'm grateful that my parents, obviously, we had a form of church. We had a form of understanding who God was. Um, yeah, and so I'm grateful for that. But, man, to know that I've come through high school, because of the trauma that I've gone through, again, I would have viewed God and been like, how could you have allowed me to go through all of that pain all of that abuse, and then be taught that you're a loving God. So, you know, for me, that was, again, I had a very warped view of who God was in my life growing up. But yet, somewhere in the back of me, I know he's real. Do you know what I mean? But that's, again, still half, half the theology, all of that ideology, everything that you can, you know, that I have learned in my later years. Um, I mean, gosh, how many times have I walked up to the altar call? <laughs> Hey, how many times have I said, <laughs> I'm going to repent and then I'm going to give my life to Jesus? I think I did that many a times while I was my early uh, 20s, you know, um, because again, you get caught up in your feels. Hey, someone just needs to sing a nice little worship song and all of a sudden, Aggie feels guilty, you know, and then you go and repent. And so, But again, still just not getting it, eh? But even in that, this is what I love about God. You know, even in all of those moments where I just kept trying to repent and trying to come to him, he was just like, I've already got you. Why are you trying to do everything when I've already done it for you? Mm. You know, and so the the realization of understanding his death at the cross, all of that stuff, blah, 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 I know we all know about. Um, it has only become, I suppose, so much more real. And I've always known that. it's be, the, the understanding of God in my life and my faith journey has been that I, it's because I had never known who I was, right? So here I am trying to figure out who I am. And the only way I'm ever, ever going to figure out who I am is finally understanding who I am in Christ. Mm. And that's really where it came down to, right? And I think that may have been more so 2008 when I had my daughter. 2008, ever since then. And let me tell you, it's been my, I've had a dramatic life since then. And I've failed many times since 2008. But he literally invaded my life because, again, I went off and did the whole, oh, I got pregnant again, you know. Um, I had my daughter out of wedlock, as, you know, my parents were not happy about and, and whatnot. But, um, yeah, it was finding out. I mean, this is how I know God works so funnily in my life um, is when I got pregnant and I didn't even know I was pregnant. I think... Um, I met her father, we went through, you know, relationship, but then I called it off. But before I had known that I was pregnant, um, I was already five months, five oh. and a half months. But I keep complaining about, you know, I had a bad back, da da da, all that stuff <laughs> from things. <laughs> <laughs> What, yeah, what, what things? What, what things? <laughs> what things are we talking about here? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, nothing's, nothing's off the table. Yeah, 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 nothing's off the table. Anyway, what do I do? I go. So this is the funny thing: the, to not have known that I was pregnant right up until five and a half months was because yeah, I complained I had a sore back. Then I went to the doctors with my girlfriend, and then they tell me to go take a urine test, and then all of a sudden they're like, "You do realize that you're like five, nearly six months pregnant?" I went, "Sorry." Let me tell you, during that time that I was with her uh, father, again, still going through this, you know, unworthiness, not knowing, you know, not knowing who I am, blah, blah, blah. Because I've, I, during that time, if I had known that I was pregnant, I would have aborted her. Mm. That's why I know God had saved her more so. Save her. Save your mum. Mm. So that's why I believe he let me not know that I was pregnant until oh. I was about five and a half going on to six months. Because I know damn well the life that I was going through then, it was going down another spiral, I would have aborted her. Because you know you can only abort a child at a certain mm. time frame, right? So like I say, I feel like just, you know, yeah. God has just afforded me so many times. I mean, if you look back at my son, oh, that's the other story. Like you think that's a miracle with just having to save my daughter so that she can save me, is... God saving my son so that he can save me again is when I had my son. You know, when I was pregnant with my son, beautiful um, pregnancy, going into delivery, it's my first child. And then um, he finally came out, had him for about two minutes on, on my chest. 
And you know when you see doctors and you look at their faces and think, they don't look happy. They look like something's wrong. Mm. And I told them, I don't feel well. So from those two minutes that I had my boy, I did not see him for the next three days. Oh. Uh, sorry, next two days. I didn't see him for the next two days. Um, I went into a coma. Um, so I had lost, or like, you know, we only have five litres of blood in our body. I think I lost just over four. Um, and they were trying to find blood everywhere and whatnot, rushed me off to the hospital. And again, yeah, I was in a coma for the next two days, so I didn't, I didn't know what had happened after that. And so honestly, I just feel like God has just, uh, his grace on my life just to save me constantly, has been through my children. And I feel like he, that's why my journey with God has been a very difficult one. It's a difficult one, but it's one that I would never have changed because he's taught me that even through all the bullshit, all the hurt and the trauma and pain, I am here. I'm here and my children are here and he has blessed us so much more. I don't, I don't know how to say that to people. People yeah. are just like, right? And I honestly, I have been a dick throughout my life. Like there are many <laughs> times I've been a dick and I've probably hurt people too. And many times I look back and think that just, I don't know. I honestly sometimes have told God, you should have kicked me to the curb ages ago. Do you know what I mean? I'm like, why would you afford me this platform? when you know that I've mucked up so many times. But I think he's used quite a few people in the Bible <laughs> <laughs> who have mucked up quite a bit. And so that has reminded me. Yeah, you know, it has reminded me many times. Yeah. I'm like, here I am trying to be perfect, but it's it's not. I, I yeah. You know, they talk about the whole keeping up with appearances, keeping up with the Kardashians, that whole thing. <laughs> eh? I was just, I don't know who I was trying to keep up with. But um, yeah, just I feel like God has afforded me. I understand what grace is. And this is the reason why I named my daughter her name was because when I went through that whole pregnancy with her and then for God to wait until I was about five and a half or six months pregnant to then tell me that I am pregnant and I went and took those tests is why I ended up doing a, this is why words are so beautiful to me is that I ended up doing a word study for my daughter's name and that word study had taught me about what kept coming through was the word grace and I knew it and I knew then I, that's when I knew she was going to be a girl so I didn't know I just knew off of that, when I heard the word grace, I knew she was going to be a girl. And so from there, I did a word study. But then I was saying to God, everybody has a daughter called Grace. I want something different. I like to be different. Um, and so I did a word study, and then I ended up finding the um, Greek word for grace, which is Carice. And this is the reason why my daughter's name is Carice, is because she is the epitome of grace and reminds me constantly every single day. When she was born, I honestly, this is why I feel like God is good to me. Um, even when she was born, literally she had a birthmark on her forehead and it looked like a thumbprint. And honestly, oh. to me, to this day, I've always felt like that is God's thumbprint on my daughter's life, <clears throat> reminding me of God's grace. Mm. That's powerful. Yeah. Unmerited oh, favor. Unmerited oh, I'm probably the <laughs> least person <laughs> that deserves it. Um, and, you know, yeah, people know they've seen it. I've, but yeah, I've just realized within that, I've, I've, I've understood how God has seen my heart. And I know sometimes our heart can be deceitful, mm. but it's beyond that. It's just like um, when he said that it was done, it was done mm. at the cross. So I don't know why throughout my whole entire life, I've always tried to go and search for other things to have to have fulfilled what he had already done. Do you know what I mean? So for me, it's just like, Aggie, relax, <laughs> relax. Um, I've done it for you, so I'm not sure what you're trying to fulfill or, or be. Yeah. That's powerful because, you know, a lot of the things that you went through, it's hard to sort of come out the other end. Yeah. You know? And but you talk about healing, you talk about forgiveness. Mm. You talk about um taking up saying yes, taking up these opportunities and and those who are believers and understand like mm. if you know you know yeah. what you're talking about yeah it's only through god's grace that you're able to um yeah able to heal the way you have yeah and so yeah i just find it amazing and um i like and it gives me this understanding of okay when this opportunity comes that's mm quite out of your comfort zone, something that you're prayed about mm. and nothing, you never went looking for it. No. Only just ask God about it and it comes, you understand, okay, I'm going to move on. Because not everyone's going to pick up yeah. their life, um, the comfortability of where you are now. And even with your kids, like 
but just to hear the story is like oh man there's there's a massive backstory to this very point and it's yeah. so exciting to hear about and I can't wait to <laughs> to see how it pans out. I, I just feel like, man, I'm talking to the the bus fika Oprah. Oh, you know? Yeah. You know? Yeah. I think I know you shared when we came on um the morning sh- uh, yeah. five thirty one. Yes, yeah. that's right. Yeah. Um you shared about wanting to do a Women's podcast. Yes, yeah, absolutely. I reckon you'll be amazing, <laughs> sis. But you and have, I would you love have. to. You I have, have started, started. Like, I have oh, started. Cool. And I think that's my thing is, you know what it was? It was really <coughs> like, hey, I would love to be have this set up. Uh, <laughs> no, like, let's yeah. be honest, right? Because everyone spe- speaks about doing a podcast. Not everyone is geared for a podcast. Mm. Do you know what I mean? And But for me, what it, what I wanted to was start off just me. And I know you, Petit, you understand that, right? And I started, and I've, it's been on a bit of a break, but I just wanted, I knew I had to start something. And it had to be about the grief, the healing, love, life, all of those things. But that stemmed out of the death of my mother, you know, and that was just last year. And I didn't know what it was. I had said to God, what am I going to, like, I was failing. Like, I, uh, like if there is ugly, <laughs> if there is an ugly cry and an ugly grief that anyone's gone through, I feel like Aggie went through it last year. I thought I could be strong. I thought I could be strong for my kids. Um, But man, that grief was on another level. Not to say that I didn't have grief when my father passed away, which would have been back in 2004. But I feel like because my mum had lived with me for the last eight years, and other than my job, she was, I would say my other job, you know, going home and having to care for your parents. A lot of times I know that as Pacific people, that's just our duty, right? But let me tell you, that was a very begrudgingly duty that I could not have, I I hated it. I hated having to be the youngest child and being the one that had to take in their mother. Like, let's be honest. Like, but yet I love my mum. Like, I love her and she gave me life. But damn, we are so two peas in a pod. We're the same. We are so similar that that is why we struggled so much with each other, right? We were so stubborn, so mad at each other. We could not easily forgive each other because it's like, no, you're wrong. You know, you're wrong. Oh, my gosh. Um, And, you know, she was a strong woman. But I, again, for me, because I had not healed from certain things. And, guys, this is only last year. Mm. I'm still having to heal from certain Mm. things is that, I could not I could not easily afford my mum forgiveness because she's the closest thing to me. And that is the hardest thing a lot of our relationships in life is we can't afford forgiveness to the people that are closest to us. But we can forgive everybody else who's crossed you at the road and, you know, cut you off at the road. But when someone has done you wrong, and not to say that my mum had done me wrong, there are a couple of things that we just internally, um, yeah, we weren't able to be open enough to talk about those conversations. And so... The grief this time has been very overwhelming and I'm still trying to navigate that space. Mm. But at the same time, trying to navigate that with my children who often, because of the way that I'm wired, I want to know what you're feeling right now. (laughs) (laughs) Hey, don't sit there and be like, "Mm." (laughs) Um, uh, yeah, so, and that is my son though. He takes a lot longer to process, but I have to understand that, that that's just the way he's geared. And then my daughter is very much open, will say whatever she needs to say. And then again, but then she gets angry because <laughs> she's just like, far mum, just calm down, let us, you know, process things. But yeah, I'm, I'm very much impatient with things in life. So when I've been afforded grace, it just, uh, I have to keep saying to God, honestly, how do you keep allowing me to go to the next level of something in life, like with my career, with my children or whatever, when I'm so stubborn, I'm so impatient. You know, I want things now. I need you to get my order from McDonald's now. <laughs> I need, you know, like I'm just like Uber Eats is like you could have gone it, you know. So <laughs> I'm so. Oh no, I'm for real. I'm very impatient, and now I'm sitting here going, I need to go to the toilet. <laughs> Yeah, have you guys, can we have a break? <laughs> yes, 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 yes. Yeah, you, you, you want to go? Yes. Yeah, can yeah, I go, go to the go, loo, go. please? I don't know where you're looking. Okay. A few moments later. Sure. We don't talk about that. But then when somebody, you know, I always I always go, okay, let's teach people have, how to have these conversations. And they go, oh, it's so tapu, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, mm. bro, that's only the beginning chicken, of the chicken conversation. Chicken, man, chicken. Chicken. <laughs> no, but that's only the beginning of the conversation because the next part is I've been raped. And then people go, what the f- <laughs> 
Yeah, and they stop yeah. the conversation right there. And so my question is, because you've had that experience, you're in the room, can mm. you pick up when someone's... Can you do you have that ability to kind of pick up when somebody is showing those signs that they may have been because the stats are too freaking high for us to ignore? Like, I work yeah. in the space when they say one in 20 could be thinking about suicide over a two week period. People are like, Man, we need to we need to have these programs, blah blah blah. But when it comes to sexual abuse, what's the what's the um, what's the I think it's rate? one in four, one in four for men, one in four, one in is it, is one, it in one in four for men? Um, it, it, oh, oh, no, I, I think it's it, I took about um. I think about um, being yeah, sexually ab- sexual abuse. Because when I was in, when I was in three, I teenager, think. right, and they said it was one in five, I tell you now, every group of one in five girls that I was in, mm. like uh, uh, there was always one. That stat was on point. There was always one that had gone through some kind of sexual abuse. And then, mm. and like I've only got four friends, but then um, there was you know, like, you know, the, when you're in a group of five, there's one. There's always one. And then you just kind of go... We don't know how to talk about it. But we're not even, you know, like, what are the signs? So that we don't ignore it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We we can't ignore it. We actually have to go, hey, look out for that girl, look out for that boy. Like, don't just ignore these signs instead of going, oh, she's Mm. promiscuous, she's blah, 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 blah. Sure. Hey, nah, cut those labels. There's something else happening in that young person's life that we need to pay attention to. Mm. And if we're not taught this, mm. we just go on labelling, 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 and that poor person just goes on going, I'm just trying to find something to heal myself, man. Of course. I'm trying to respond to the freaking trauma that I didn't ask for. Mm. I'm trying to recover what some asshole just took away from me. Mm. Of course. And that's how you, you've lived. You've just, you're just trying to recover, recover, mm. recover, get it back, get it back, get it back. And everyone else around you is going, labelling. Labeling, mm. but I I can guarantee now we're all also, the back of our heads. Yeah, people know, people know something's up, but we're not given us we're not given the opportunity the to, tools. to yeah and the tools yeah to, to, to do something. You yeah. know what I mean? I think there's a lot of people that don't know my story, right? Yeah. So when you say there's one in five, I would no, that's pretty the, much say it's probably more like three in five. Yeah, I think yeah. it has come down to one in three Because, come yeah, on, when we do census stats, you know, you only give mm. the information you want to give. Mm. Are you going to tell mm. someone that this is what happened to me when I was five years old? You know, that, it's that type of conversation that there is a lot more than what is actually issued in stats and in data. Because my story, I would never have been brave enough to open up about what happened to me. Uh, yeah, if I did not... And if I did not finally want my healing, for me to finally want my healing means I have to face what happened to me when I was five years old. So can you only imagine the amount of women or men who have never said anything? So those stats I feel sometimes aren't actually real. I feel like it's more than the one in five. Um... And so when often when I used to be on air and share stories and talk about that, the vulnerability, like, you know, you would always constantly hear these stories come on, like someone's been charged for, you know, sexual rape or abuse or whatever. Um, But it was when that happened when they were like, oh, so think about it, the Royal Commission of Abuse, right? If you've heard about that, how people used to be abused in state care Mm. and in faith-based churches. Yeah. For people to finally bring that up and be able to face it is the reason why we have seen people who have gone down a wrong path Mm -hmm. because they have not dealt with it when they needed to have, Mm -hmm. right? So now this day and age, we have the resources, we have the tools, we have all of these things to be able to now finally face up to that I was abused. But at the same time, you know, like you work in the field, you don't want to re-traumatize people. But at the same time, again, I feel like that word has been <laughs> thrown out too many times it's like, because it, there's a safeguard. Eh? Yeah, I, I get that there is a safeguard because what we live in a day and age where no one wants to be pinned for anything anymore. You don't want to be saying the wrong thing oh because someone will either sue you because you never said, you know. So because of that, it's just like, damn, we we, we love words, but then we can't say the words that we need to say to be able to vocalize the fact that someone. I'm going to be honest, someone fucking raped me. Someone effing did something to me when I was five years old, either fingered me, either abused me, touched me where they didn't need to be touched, all of those things. It's like you would never see often a Pacific woman come out and say the very thing 
that somebody did to them. I get it out of respect because we are very much a people. Mm. We have to respect. But I'm just like, but if we never say what it is, yeah. then we are again, that's the re-traumatisation is that we are just trying to pedal around and pretty things up. When it that was, is the worst. And that's the worst thing you can yeah. do. I was just like, I'm sorry. If someone was fingering me when I was little, that wasn't pretty. And I can't pretty that up any other way. Mm -hmm. You did something to me that was literally taking away my innocence and you thought, you the, per the perpetrator, you thought that you could get away with it. And that's the thing. There are a lot of people who have been charged, gone to jail for rape, for sexual abuse, all of these things. But do you know how many people have not gone to jail mm -hmm. wow. for what they've done to our children? Do, yes. do you know, like, that is those stats I would like to see. Yeah. <clears throat> It's because we, are, we have not become brave enough to say that someone often within our families wow. has done something to us. And so that's what I'm saying. It's like, you've got perpetrators walking around right now mm. who had done something to you 15, 20, 30, even 40, 50 years ago. They will never have their day in court, maybe before Jesus. But do you understand we live in this land and it's just, yeah. It's just unfortunate that there, there will be, and that is why I am a big advocate yeah. for speaking on behalf of people because their story will never be told. Their person will never go to jail. Their person will never be punished for the crime that they did. Oh. And it's just like, I am very much, yeah, heaven forbid that anything ever happens to our children, right? Yeah. We are very much in that space where we would never. But I'm sure my parents were like that too. I'm sure they never thought did the they know? No, they didn't know. You didn't? Until I was 23. Jeez. Until I finally was going through some stuff, right? And then I finally opened up to my mother. What was your reaction? Not the one that I expected. Oh, yeah. Yeah, not the one that I expected. Yeah. But again, a woman who came from a place where she wouldn't have known how to deal with that. Yeah. And I, uh, yeah, but it, it caused me again to re-hate re my mother. You know, and that's a hard thing to swallow sometimes. Yeah. Because I really did, at a point in my life, not like her. Mm. Because she, if I'm going to be honest, uh, wanted it to be swept under the carpet yeah. again. Yeah. Yeah. So it just, again, that re me. It was like the one person I think I really wanted to believe me um, didn't. Yeah. Oh, no. Let me rephrase that. She believed me. But I just did not want to face it and 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 deal with it, um, which yeah, which really hurt me a lot as an adult again. Uh, but please, no, I forgive me. Like you know, we've come to a place where we had gone through that. Mm. But at that moment and at that time, um, it was really hard to swallow. Yeah, a very hard pill to swallow because yeah, using your superpower of empathy. Mm -hmm. Why do you think mum did that? She wanted to keep the VAR. Yeah. And that's, it's a massive trade-off, eh? Wanted to keep the VAR between, yeah. between family. Mm. Um, which for me, I'm like, hey, I would take you down the road. And, like, <laughs> and <it's> just, <laughs> I would take you down the road and shoot you right out. Like, yeah. you know, yeah. <laughs> just saying that. But, um, but I've, I have uh, come to a place where I've really... Maybe, maybe it's even more part of the grief that I'm feeling now with my mum gone. I'm feeling like there is a, there is a healing that uh, to understand, you know, like I say, man, God, you've taken me out of so many things. Like, do you know, like I can, for me, it's like I can't keep turning around and having been mad at someone yet knowing that what God has afforded me mm. all the time. Like how do you save someone all the time, yeah. but then yet still come up and still be angry? Yeah. You know, it's just, it doesn't make sense. But I liked what you said earlier. You said... There's a reason why people do what they do. Yeah. You know, and like you just said about mum, she had to hold, there was something else. It, I, she, she probably did feel the grief oh, of her, oh, no, hearing that from you. Yeah. The bigger picture for her, like if I now address this, all of this stuff, that she's probably seeing the picture. What I, see, what I, what I now know, see, and that's probably maybe sucks because it's like she's gone. But what, what I now know and what I've had to to channel and work through and navigate through is that um, I think her biggest grief was not to try and keep the VAR 
It's just I feel like she felt guilty that she did not protect me. Yeah, wow. That's really where it comes from. She has to live with that. Oh yeah, and that's and you she know and that. because I had to look at myself and say, oh. how would I have felt if something had heaven forbid again happened to my child? I would be beside myself that mm. I was not there. Yeah. To prevent that. Yeah. And you know, my parents, we all our parents came from the islands. They just had to go work, 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 right, and be, and our, and the kids would be okay at home. Yeah. Unfortunately, that didn't happen. But so for me, it's like they obviously only just knew what they knew. Mm. And they learned what they learned. Um, so yeah, I I give it up to my mother, because my mother, and that's the other thing. I always have to look at where she came from. She was, if you see the gap between her and my father, I mean, she married my father when she was only about twenty two years old. My dad was forty something. Wow. And she took on his children. So for me, I always have to understand that, you know, I may have had issues growing up. But I'm sure she had Menia herself, mm. and the the weight that she had to carry and take on and be such a young single woman, and marry a man who's already like got kids and you know, um, yeah, I have to give it up to her. I know, she, and then she was plucked out of the islands, came with my father over here, so it's a whole new world, right? So I understand that there are things that my mum has gone through that I feel like I I wish I'd just taken the time. Mm. To have understood her more and her story rather than just being bloody mad at her mm. about life because you didn't do what I needed you to do for me. Yeah. 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 Trust us for sharing all of that. <laughs> <laughs> but like, I'm, I'm thinking about yeah. our young girls and even young boys right now mm, mm. that might listen in and probably going through mm. this hidden this uh, some of these hidden things that they're going through and and you know in hindsight you can look back and mm. wish you and you're very understanding of what your mother might have went through but what do you wish for the young Aggie like what do you wish she had at that time for someone that's probably going through something now that's probably being mm. affected by a family member or someone that's taken their innocence, that's struggling, that's quiet right now. Mm. How can we encourage them to, I don't know, find the right support? Be because uh, it's hard to say, yeah, be brave, speak out. But sure. they probably think about all these other things that they're going, you know, walking yeah. through at the moment. Um, we've come. Yeah. Yeah. Like you're saying, you're right. Everyone say, speak out, ask for help. But to be honest, when you're going, when you're experiencing that. Mm. And you're trying to figure out what the F just happened. How do I restore that? Why do I feel so... Um, mm. I f yeah, why do I feel like someone's just ripped half of my life away from me? Mm. And then everyone's like, speak out. <laughs> like, right. what do... What, like, yeah, great <clears throat> question, Charles. What like, do you wish you had? How do you, Yeah, what do you tell people to say? Oh, I wish I had a me. <laughs> Back then. Um, the... The thing about my, um, I, I have to, full context on, on, on how I'm going to explain this. Um, my kids, I have a 22-year-old son and I have a 14-year-old daughter. Uh, and I think I shared about this before we came on, on air. Um, the law of first mention. I honestly, if, if when I was younger, if my parents understood what it meant to tell me first... Um, how to deal with, what if this happens, this is what you do. If they had spoken to me about uh, what sex was, maybe I would probably have lessed not been so promiscuous and try and go find it somewhere else. Uh, if I'd smoke weed, if I'd, you know, smoke, drink, all of these things, like to tell me first what it is that are the consequences of doing certain things, maybe, mm, just maybe, but uh, and don't get me wrong, my all our parents told us, yeah, that's na that's naughty, that's bad, blah, blah, blah. Um, for my kids now, I see through all of their friends who have now fight who constantly come over to our house and share their stories. And it's sad sometimes because they say they can't have this conversation with their parents. Yet I'm a parent. If I was younger and I was able to tell the story of what happened to me when I was five. I wish 
the only thing I, I think what our young people often are um, struggle with is that, um, especially in the day of social media, is that we won't believe them. That is often why children don't say anything is because they fear that you won't believe what they are telling you. Because, again, we come from a culture that you would never, who would, you know, the VAR between a brother and a sister, meant to be tight as, right? You respect, you look after your brothers and sisters, even your aunties and uncles, all of that. And then if that is the, the case then, why is it that often abuse comes from within rather than without? is because we haven't spoken about what a VAR actually looks like between a brother and sister and between family members and how they should be able to be part of your life. And so a lot of kids that I've been dealing with recently or over in the last maybe five, ten years, um, a lot of them have said it's because the trauma that they've gone through is because it's within. So family, remember everyone says F-O-E, family over (laughs) everything. (laughs) Hey, so if family is over everything, then that you are speaking out that family is over even your abuse, yeah. even over your trauma, mm. even over you trying to find healing. Remember everything for the sake of family. So then why would a child speak up? Because they're like, they now have the weight to have to carry that I'm trying to hold on and be like, but my parents said, it's family, everything for family. So I think sometimes that's why I say we should not be very flippant about words, throwing words out or throwing sayings mm. and, and, and trends because it can become the detriment and the even the downfall of a family. Mm. And don't get me wrong, me and my kids, we still struggle, we go through things, you know, but I'm just so grateful that um, I spoke to my daughter only because she's like me, Right. I think you will find the way you can tell your child about things and how to navigate taboo topics like sex. And for me, because of what I've gone through, I needed her to know what that was, what that looked like. How does a man, woman come together? Woman, woman, you know, man, man, it's all, you know, it's anything these days. But I had to tell her what that looks like. And you know, the funniest thing recently, she is at a high school, a girl's high school, and I remember one time, so I've told her, she's 14 now, I remember speaking to her about sex when she was six. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Just having to tell her, because why? Because of what happened to me when I was five. Mm. And I just knew, I was just thinking, how do you stop a generational curse? How do you stop the intergenerational going on? I must start now at the age that what happened to me, then you're going to find out what it should look like and what the sanctity of sex looks like Mm. right because a lot of times we're told that sex is bad but in the context of where it should be and where it should be valued that's what you need to be teaching your children Mm. because that's when you feel like you can give it up for anybody I was not taught that again my parents didn't know any better but that is why I'm an advocate for me being the first person to mention it to my children because why should you learn about that from every other Tom, Dick and Harry because Every other Tom, Dick and Harry is about your age and they wouldn't even know much themselves. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's like we all had, when we were teenagers, we were all trying to figure it out from each other, right? Um, but there is wisdom. There is wisdom from parents. Mm. And that is one thing that I lacked often of not being able to take the wisdom from my parents, right? And I, it sucks now, but you know, now I know. So now I know as a parent that there is gold in us as a mother and a father, the wisdom that you give your children will be a lifesaver. Mm. And so my daughter went to her, oh, she's finished now, um, but when she was at um, school, you know, you've got the sex education. Mm. And then they send out and say, would your daughter be part of this? I said, no, because I can tell her everything that she needs <laughs> to know. On you. That's awesome. But what I was surprised was, out of a school that probably has about 800, she was the only one. She was the only one, everyone. And I'm not to say, like, so to, please don't get me wrong. It's not to say that everyone else is, uh, or whatever, that, you know. But um, she did say to me, she goes, oh, it felt awkward because I was just sitting there by myself out in the hallway while everyone else was having the sex ed talk. And I said to her, well, what do you think you would have learned from this? She goes, whatever you would have already told me anyway. Wow. You know? Mm. 
And so it was, that's for me, is a win for me because I don't ever want her to grow up and think that um, when she becomes a mother, that her advice would fall on deaf ears when mm. she has children. I want my, what I hold dear to me to be golden nuggets for her and the generation after her. Mm, that's cool. I don't want it to just to be given to her by anybody. Yeah. And but I, yeah, I that's, yeah, sorry. So <laughs> trying to roll that back is just understanding. Children just want to be seen. Children, if, if you watch a child who's probably either gone through abuse, I would only say it isn't always the ones that are quiet. Mm. It isn't always the ones that are refraining and like don't want to be part of something. It can, it, that's the problem. Well, abuse has no favourites. Hey, wow. you, you could be the loud one. You could be putting a mask on and pretending that you're right. So that's the harder thing is having to try and look and, and find cues about whether or not, hey, because you don't want to be sitting there going, oh, you've been abused. No. You've been abused. Like, <laughs> no, you know, you don't, you don't obviously do want to have that, yeah. that look, but you just want to make sure. I think of anything, how important conversations are, mm. the dalanoa and the onus that sits on us as older people to be able to have that conversation with your kids and continuously tell them it's okay if you are going through something, like just let them know. Mm. Yeah, safe space sometimes <laughs> irks me too. <laughs> that word safe yeah. space, I, I get it. Space. But yeah, because again, we throw those words out and it's like, well, I thought I was safe, but obviously it wasn't because somebody decided to, you know, so. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's different for everyone. Safety. It's different for everyone. It's so I just think, everyone. I just think you, it, it, I mean, gosh, let, let us not be ones to go out and be like <laughs> looking around and going, oh, yeah, you look like a person that's been abused. Yeah. Like you look like, does. E. She's yeah. in her workshop <laughs> going. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's not even that. No, I know, but no, see, you but sit in that, that space, but E, I think you'll just know. Yeah. There is a thing where, off. I don't know what it is, I'm just going to say this. I feel like obviously women have a better intuitive um, inclined to, mm. to see it more than men. I'm not maybe only because it happens a lot more to women. So there is that mm -hmm. thing where yeah. I feel like we all maybe operate in a certain way, but um, but I know it happens to men too, and I've spoken yeah. to many men too. Yeah. I, I think when we get to that point where we start labelling kids, you know, just label them because you can't quite understand their behaviours. Yeah. And then like it happens in the school system, right? Mm. At a young age, kids mm. acting up, and then all of a sudden they're given this name. Or given this label, oh, they just um, they're, they're not a good learner. They're not, yeah, of you know, course. they're um, different. Mm. And people do that as a shortcut mm. to really trying to understand, like, who is this kid? Yeah, it's not who is this kid. It's what is this kid? And it's almost like put a label on that kid, yeah. and maybe everyone else can just treat the kid that way. And it's so unfair when there's yeah. a story Behind. there. I remember this kid picked up a chair, threw it out the window. Smart as man, mm. super talented, athletically. Just this dude was neck level, but mm. he just had stuff happening. And what did the teachers do? Label him. Go to the principal's office, and the nobody stops to go, "Hey, everything all right? Yeah. yeah. Hey, why are you acting like this? Mm. What are you trying to say? Mm. Hey, this other kid we went to go. Um, he was another kid that they just labeled all the time. Little shit, little shit. Mm. We went to his house. Oh my gosh, we went to his house and um, you know the, the story was about this kid, was he, his mum hadn't come out of her room, mm. not for days or weeks, months. Wow. Why? Because she was depressed. A year ago she'd accidentally slept on her baby, baby died. Anyone pick that up? Mm. Anyone bloody ask? Anyone go to his house? No, nobody did. They just caught him little shit and what did he do? He ended up playing that label. Mm. Playing that label and... That's what I mean. Yeah. Like, I think when we start labelling kids and we haven't even got to know them, that's when you need to stop that crap and actually get to know that kid. Find out what wow. their story is. Yeah. Because that, that so travels with them right throughout the education. Mm. I had, yeah, I had one kid who had, to this day stands out for me of one of my uh, most profound interviews on air. Um, you know, he's talking about uh, working together with BBM, right? And, and and I love the work that Dave Letelli does, you know, with the youth and stuff like that. And then um, they brought this young boy on, right? Has been part of maybe ram raids, robberies, all this sort of thing. He's trying to change his life. Beautiful. I was like, awesome. And then it came to the point where I just simply asked him, I said, why do um, why do you think people, uh, the youth are going and doing um, ram raids, all this stuff? And 
I was not expecting him to all of a sudden get emotional. And he literally just broke down and goes, yeah, people think we're just shit. Say, like, people think we're just nobodies. But if anyone really knew, the reason why we go do this dumb shit is because no one sees us. <laughs> no one cares about us. We just want attention. Yeah. And when you want attention, bad attention is any attention, right? It's, it's, yeah. It doesn't matter. It's as long as they get a bit of attention. Yeah. So even if it is bad attention... It is attention. Yeah, and they call them attention seeking. Yeah. Uh, hello, that's what they're doing. Yeah, and so for me to hear that young boy and just sort of speak very bravely about the fact that he goes, I just wish people would see us. I'm like, hmm. You know, and that's often kids. They are not seen even though they love to be seen online. Like this world of online social media, we all play into it. We are all part of it. But I think if we are not seeing beyond what is actually being posted, I think we can get caught up in the whole hype of what social media is versus what is really happening in mm. someone's life. Mm. And so I think for a lot of kids is why they turn to social media is because someone sees me, right? Mm. I've got some views all of a sudden. But it, it, the thing is, it's, you don't need views. What you need is to know who you are first, yeah. which is what Aggie went through. Like, oh my gosh, can you imagine if social media was around our time? Oh God, I just, yeah, it would have- fans page. Yeah, oh. <laughs> <laughs> what do you mean? I'm allowed to have fans. Only fans with your bandana. <laughs> can you imagine me in like literally Tupac doing my <laughs> yeah. only fans? Okay. Like, my hit him up, I mean, really. Like, <laughs> but that's what I'm saying. It just is, see, it, whatever would have transferred from one generation to another has just, ex, like, it's exponential. It's even way yeah. more now. But it's just in a different avenue. And so what when we felt like we were unseen, it is more so now, just in a different way. And so it's not like it's anything's changed, right? It's just the, the method. The mm. method has changed. But it's still the same trauma. Same we needs. all still same Trauma. needs, same hurt, same pain. Yeah. Yeah. Just I want to be seen. I yeah, it heard. is. So good want you to believe me? It. Yes. Far out. Simple, guys. <laughs> it's very freaking simple. <laughs> it's, it's, yeah. it's incredible. And I'm, I'm just sitting here. I'm just silently sitting here, <laughs> again, just listening to your story, just soaking it all in. It's incredible. I tell you, I'm like, I've heard part of your story and I'm like, man, I'm hearing in just the depth of your story, even more so kind of unraveling and unpacking like, oh my gosh. <laughs> and as, as men, like as, as Charles and I, we sit here and I'm in the midst of these beautiful wahine uh, tour here. But um, I, I think of, you know, because I'm still, I'm still back there. I'm still back there, I'm Aggie, in terms of your stories. Like, my gosh, th th this guy will just leave you at the altar. Uh, you know, this, um, yeah, bring it up again. <laughs> no, 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 no. no. <laughs> No, we haven't even got to the third one. No, no, no. that's still the first oh, no. one. Oh, is this kind of reflection? I don't know. I'm just, I'm just, I'm just sitting here thinking. But my goodness, the, the, what you've it's just uh, all these incidents and what you had to had to go through, uh, mm. Agnes. It's just and even um just 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 the sexual abuse at the, the age of five, mm. and then this other guy just leaves you. Like, oh my gosh, I'm thinking to, I'm thinking to myself in terms of men, mm. men in terms of like, obviously it's, it's quite popular. And then a lot of people have been talking about these this discussions around toxic masculinity, all that kind of stuff. Yeah. And I'm thinking to myself, how would you even perceive at, at that time or even now, mm. even now, so um, Aggie, in terms of men, your mindset around men, obviously you, you're still single. Yeah. I don't know why you're still single, but you know, <laughs> but, but the thing is- On the weekend, no. <laughs> But, but yeah, what's because I'm thinking of uh, yeah. nine to five. I'm single, guys. <laughs> but I'm thinking, Agnes, in terms of uh, men and now, in terms of what would you like in, in your mindset right now, like your, your view and your perce yeah. perceptive, uh, perception of, of men. Look, I have to go back again to God. This is the reason why I know God gave me my son first, right? And yeah. why I had my why I had mm. a boy first, purely to uh, make me understand the warped view that I did have of men has literally changed since I've had my boy. And in the sense of more so, um, yeah, his father left us. But I have always, always told my son, I've never spoken ill of him in front of my son. Awesome. And that was the one thing that I had to do. Even though he, <laughs> probably the father thinks I have said bad things about him, but that was the one thing I always knew was to never speak ill of his father to him because he is still half of him. And he represents who he is, right? Is is that both of us made this boy 
And so I don't want to speak to a part that where he is still having to try and navigate what that looks like to be a man mm. because he only had a mother. Now he had uncles and all of that around and men to speak into his life. Um, but what I've always taught my son is he's now 22. Throughout his whole life, always told him little bits about his father and then came to a point about, okay, well, what actually happened? Why are you not together? Tell that story. Always had to paint a picture of making his father still... Even though he did what he did, and to anyone's eyes it would have been like, what a dick, you know. But I still have to prop him up to a point where, hmm, as much as God loves me, he loves him too. So I can't take away the fact that what God has created, there are still good men out there. And I hope that I've raised one. And to this day, I have always said to my son, when you're ready, when you want to come to that point, where you want to go and find your father, I'm more than happy to support you. Let me get the shotgun first, but no, 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 no. I love yeah, this one. Yeah, good. <laughs> but yeah, to always to navigate and to help him and understand. But even to this day, I don't know where my my boy is at. I I do understand he has said he's he hasn't felt like he's had to. Um, he is still on that journey, right? And so I have just cool. said, just know I will always be there until you want to take that step. Then all goods, we'll go there. And the same thing for my daughter, a little bit different, right? Her father, sort of in and out, you know? So, and there has been that conversation I've had with my kids about fathers, is that they both have perceived their father in a different light, even though they both are fatherless. My son has never seen his father. So it's one of those things where he's like, all goods. My daughter has had a father who was in and out, broken promises, and so that's caused her to have her view where it's a little bit warped again because he obviously hasn't come to play. But that is due to both the father and myself making choices back then, right? So with all of that to say, yeah, I still have told them, I to this day never talk. I just feel like we can't always diss men. Because if we look at it, I grew up with two great brothers. Like, I grew up with great brothers. So I always just think when people just say, ah, men are dicks that You know, they, all of a sudden you, you get a label mm. on what men look like just because of what you've gone through. So for me, mm. it's like I can never do that. I can never put a label on a man because we all muck up. We all make mistakes. But I've seen what good men look like. I just haven't found one yet, so uh, <laughs> my number is no, 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 no. no, no. Okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> you got six days before she heads to Melbourne. Come on, guys, come on, Melbourne. guys. Hey, hey, hey. Change your mind, change your mind. <laughs> let her go to Melbourne. Yeah, yeah, please, let so me go to Melbourne. Let me just go and settle. Nah, yeah. But that, yeah, so for me, it's just like I had a great father. I had great brothers. I've got great guy cousins. So... Have some people mucked up along the way? Yeah, I've, I've obviously experienced it. But I cannot take away the factors that uh, it took two to tango. So I can't always talk about thinking that they did the wrong. Yeah. I did the wrong somewhere along the lines too. Yeah. i got to take ownership for the shit that I did too. And yeah. I'm, glad, I'm glad you you, you said that because I, I, I can imagine. If it was someone else who was probably in the same predicament, experienced the same kind of yeah. – uh, incident, I can imagine there would be like a woman like, oh man, I'm bitter towards men, I hate men, no. all that kind of stuff. Because you hear it now, you hear it in the yeah. media, you hear all these these stories in terms of toxic masculinity, men mm. who have just, uh, you know, demonizing men, all that kind of stuff. And you hear that like, man, mm. but I love the fact that you say, hey, because of your own son, he said, man, I'm raising up this this boy who is now a man yeah. to be a, a good man. Yeah. And then you've, your, your own experiences with your, your dad and your uncles or yeah. your your brothers, like, man, these are, these are still good men. You could easily kind of swear the other ways that you know what the hate men they just I just but oh. just it's, it's amazing it's, it's, it's beautiful because it's it's easy to hate mm -hmm. yeah. right let's, let's be honest it's easy to hate it's hard to do the right thing that that's really the the honest truth so is it easier to beg my children's fathers absolutely <laughs> I could go to town <laughs> on that you know but it just is what is that going to do though or who is that going to like help and so for my children I want them to be different because they should never have seen what they had seen they should never have experienced what they have experienced so it's trying to break 
generational curses i'm very much that thing i just don't want things to have to carry on like the buck stops here like what i had to deal with that's it mm-hmm. you don't have to but that takes a lot of work eh? they would have taken yes, a does. lot of <laughs> internal and self-awareness to get to that place because yeah but my kids have seen me at my ugliest mm. like let's be honest it's not that they have seen the thou art on my knees holy and praying and being like <laughs> lord you know like come through for us no um they have seen me at my ugliest where i was like drunk off my face my son has had to pick me up off the floor my you, do you know what i mean they've seen me go off and just do dumb shit mm. but to a point where it's just like you know what i'd rather them see it through me than have to have them experience that themselves Mm. so that they know (laughs) mama did it all for us so we don't need to have to go down that road and I you know my son has a girlfriend now and you know let me tell you it's just always to know make sure as much as you treat uh make sure you treat that girl um as much as you treat your sister you know what I mean it's that whole thing of that vibe between now it's just making sure that you know women are precious but so are men Men are very precious because you come in a place where you stand, where not well, you do things that women, only women can do, and women can only do things that men can't do. Do you know? It's just we, we have to applaud the roles that we have. Mm. We have to applaud each other. We have to cheerlead each and every person, a man and a woman, in this space. Which is why I'm still an advocate for the sanctity of marriage. I mm. love marriage. I looked at it and I saw my parents live a happy marriage. It's what I was after. Unfortunately, I didn't get it, but that's okay. That doesn't mean that I've all of a sudden gone off and been like, oh, fuck marriage. <laughs> do you know what I mean? Like, no, let, that is, hopeful. do you know what I mean? I'm, I sit in hope because let me tell you, my life has been all about hope. Mm. I can't, that's why I'm saying it's like, you can't always want to want something, but then yet still be so ungrateful about everything else and whatnot. Mm. It's just like, I've just been given too many chances, man. Like, who does that? You know, but God, he's the only one that's been able to give me mm. that many chances so that I can still sit here and be able to do what I'm doing. Mm. Yeah. Oh, that's amazing. Oh my gosh. Just take away. And I feel like, because you're at a stage, I don't know, I'm not trying not to put words in your mouth, but because you've gone through this season of like, I know who I am. Yeah. I don't need a man to complete me. Oh, no. Well, see, that's not it. Oh, okay. It's not that I don't need a man. I have had to understand. See, now you know how I always talked about reaction and response. response yeah. For me, because I'm an impatient person, <laughs> like, yeah, let's be okay. honest, I'm, nah, I'm stubborn. Like, do you know, I need the now, now, now. It is honestly it, where I am happy and I love myself and I'm proud of where we're heading and what we're doing with me and my family. It's not about not wanting a man. It's understanding, Aggie, are you content in who you are first? And I have had to battle that for, for the longest time in my life. Mm. It was why I became promiscuous, because I thought to be noticed or be wanted, I had to give myself up. But I finally have come to a point in my life where I understand I am enough. I am so enough, it's not even funny. Like, you know, like it just, but that is never to say that I can do life without a man Mm. because I've still got my brothers, still got my uncles. I've still had men around me who have supported me and made me who I am today. But oftentimes I never allowed men to be be that to me because again I was busy being hurt and traumatized by the by the shit that I went through. So it's not that I don't want a man. <laughs> shit. <laughs> oh, 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 oh. He's like, I want to see some triangle undies. And you, and he's like, I want a man. I want a man. I want a man. I want a man. I'm just so mad. I'm sorry. Oh, I would have been. Listen, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Human, but you don't human. need someone to complete you. you. Want someone to compliment you? Compliment oh. you. Oh, oh, oh. Okay, I've heard that. Like, <laughs> 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 I'm going on the words. Like chicken, like chicken. I've heard but, that line but, but before. Pastor calls it mission partner. Oui, mission hey, partner. Hey, okay. Yeah, 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 what does yeah. that mean? Someone that um. <laughs> Impossible. <laughs> Someone that empowers you to bring out the best in you and that does this life Support of you, mission. Supporting you, your mission, that, eh? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. Oh, you? And the worst in you. <laughs> yeah. Through the highs and the lows and the. I think if you can get the worst out of someone, you might yeah. be able there's hope mm. to get the best out of someone. <laughs> Look, let me tell you, the third time I tried, um, that marriage. <laughs> that marriage. Tell me. Tell me. Yeah, you haven't talked about that. 
<laughs> what did you talk that about that? had to be the shortest marriage in, in anyone's lifetime. Um, so that was, the one that, that was the only one you married. <laughs> shorter than Kim Kardashian. <laughs> oh, no, 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 no. She wins. She wins. Okay. Her 72 that was the only, hours. That was, yeah, yeah. That was the only one you married? Well, yes. So that's oh, the yeah. thing. Was with the other two, but was the only one that I ended up marrying. Excuse me. <clears throat> <laughs> where do I go? Where do I go with this story? Um, but yeah, the unfortunate part is, yeah, it only What's lasted. What's the learning? What's the, What's learning? the learning? It only lasted for six Big months, girl. really. Is free. <laughs> I'm sorry. sorry, sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, edit that up. <laughs> he, that's probably right, though. No, no, no. no. <laughs> What does that guy throw you under the bus? Um, Stay in hope plane. Stay yeah, yeah, in hope plane. <laughs> Saying uh, superpower, empathy. <laughs> yes, empathy. Oh, well, gosh, I mean, what's the learnings from that marriage is honestly, again, hindsight. <laughs> As a bitch. As a bitch, because, what was that, 2012? That would have been 2012, the life where I met somebody and I, again, it's funny, because life was actually going really good, right? And it wasn't the mere fact that I was searching for someone. And, you know, I think I had come through the season where people were just like, if someone you meet and, you know, you let them pursue you and all of that stuff, right? And I really was letting this person pursue me. Um, and I thought, maybe this is it, because I didn't really have to struggle. It was very much a, a, a pursuit. And so I was like, maybe this is it. Uh, very charismatic, very charming. Um, but then, you know, you start seeing red flags. <laughs> and you're thinking, hmm. But, you know, because you all of a sudden caught up in the, in the airy fairy love affair of, oh my gosh, this could be it. Um, yeah, unfortunately it just, I, and then, but I still said yes to the proposal of marriage, knowing that there were still things that I was not too au fait with. And then still got married, said would work it out. Um, but it was two people that came together from a place where I actually, look, I'm just, and it's not even anything to try and prop me up. I feel like this other person had come with a lot of baggage and had come with uh, a lot of hurt and trauma that they were trying to deal with. And I think what they were trying to find in another person and another woman was, again, that trying to fill the need that it would never have been me. I wouldn't have been the one to have fulfilled or, or made that home. <laughs> they needed Jesus. <laughs> 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 Even though they probably thought they had Jesus, <laughs> but um, yeah, it just is, uh, and it just became a, it became toxic. Mm -hmm. Um, there was a lot of narcissism in there, um, and I'm sure you guys have probably spoken about, you know, someone who's narcissistic and things like that, and manipulating and whatnot. But look, to this day, don't get me wrong, it was ugly. It was very ugly. Our children saw things that they should never have seen. But come to this day, look, all I can say is. There has been healing, you know, and that is probably what I hold on to, is always knowing that regardless of the bullshit that we went through, I'm so grateful for what God has afforded both of us, right? We both walk in a place where we are forgiven, and he's gone off and done what he needs to do. I'm doing what I'm doing. And, uh, you know, man, we even came to a point where we both were laughing when we went and signed our divorce papers, all happy, go lucky, and and that's it. Do you know what I mean? But what I'm grateful out of that is, man, how his children have still still consider me mum. They still call me mum, and that's a beautiful thing. You know, I I don't deserve that, but I just believe that life will teach you things to a point where you know that it's not you. It's not about you. It is about the children. It's about mm -hmm. the next generation. Mm -hmm. Whatever I learn, I hope that I can pass on to them. Um. And the three young men that I saw when they were, man, all love valley, like, you know, kids all over the place. But, man, what their biological mum has probably done with them right now, I have to give kudos to her. I think she's done an amazing thing. Obviously, I believe that she's married now. She's got other kids. But I, I give it up to her that uh, life was a little bit back and forth. But I do give kudos to her that she has done a great thing because those three boys are amazing amazing young men who are going to do great things and so for them to even still consider me mum is um very humbling to say yeah. cool. so and, and still want to be siblings to my two children that's cool yeah that's yeah, kudos to you yeah, <laughs> yeah. Not yeah. At all. so what do you say to young couples that uh <laughs> um look you know encouraged to get married mm. even though there's they both come 
to this relationship with baggage. Yeah. But they already got a date in place or they mm. they encourage like you need to get married. Mm. Got any advice and because you know you seem wise, you know you. you <laughs> I'd rather go to yeah, someone that's been through like three relationships rather than, um, <laughs> than just the one. one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I get you. Well, um, maybe I can go off of, and I'm sure my my son would be okay to talk about that. Um, you know, I've seen him and his partner um, journey through this relationship, and you know the advice that I constantly give them is that um, if you are deciding to get married, um, and again. <laughs> I'm no expert because, well, I was only married for six months, guys, come on. <laughs> that six months worth of marriage was a little bit down the hill. But what I tell them is like, you would only know how much you want to be with each other when it's just you two. Don't, don't ask me how I feel about your, your relationship. I'm not the one that's going to be living with you. So I say to my son, talk to your genge. Can you live with each other? <laughs> Yeah, can you live with each other? Can you do life together? I know you've gone through maybe already a year of stuff, but that's a year. But let's try and look down the line five years from now. You still going to love her? You still going to love her if she, you know, gets fat? If she, whatever, you know, like, let's be honest, far out. Um, things like that. Um, understanding if, if God is, it, and I have to come back to that. If God is in it, then absolutely I believe that that is something that will flourish. But for me, I've always said to my son, who, who cares? Not, not to say who cares in an arrogant way, but who cares what everyone else is saying because they will not be in your room when you two are at it. And so don't worry about what I think. As long as you love your woman, as long as you love your partner, make sure that you can see yourselves 5, 10, 15 years down the track. Just, just make the choices that you two are going to make. And I know that seems a little bit, oh, I don't know. I don't know if that's, that's like good. the best advice. It's just to understand that at the end of the day, you two will be the ones making the choice, mm. not me. Mm. I'm your going to become your wife's mother-in-law. That's all I'm going to be. Or mother-in-love, as they say. <laughs> you know, <laughs> so cheesy, eh? When I hear that, I'm like... <laughs> Every time I see the sister in love, I'm like, shut up. <laughs> Why does everyone have to all of a sudden sound so like... <laughs> Oh my gosh, too, too, too many slogans, eh? too many slogans. Like, oh oh gosh, man, okay, I'm the whatever. king of slogans. I'm going to cut it out now. But, but you talk about red flags. I like that you've done that. Yes, you talk yeah. about your own red flags. A painter's red flags. I'm oh, sorry, carry on, so sis. Carry on. I like that you talk about cap. those red flags. I yeah, like no, the red flags. Yeah, I like that you're teaching your son um, yeah. just to be like autonomous around his decisions. Yeah. This is your decision. You better it make is, it. Yeah. You seek advice, all of that. Cool. At the end of the day, it comes down to you. But you talked about those red flags. Mm. So somebody who's in this relationship, what is a red flag? Mm. And then how do you address it? Do you you know, do you just go, oh, I love him and, you know, it'll be fine? Or do you, what do you do with that red flag? Because the red flag is something different, eh? <laughs> that's, one, that's another whole... <laughs> That's a, yeah, that, man, that's a podcast okay, on its we'll own. Get, yeah, 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 yeah. The, we won't get into the um, details of the red flag, but you no, pick yeah. up a red flag, what do you do with it? Do you just question it? Do you test it? Do you like because those red flags are there for a reason. Absolutely. And that's not because I, I, I don't know. So so this is, I, I, so this is the red thing. Flags. I have a yes. friend who had a red flag. <laughs> yeah. Nobody knows who this friend is, okay? Um <laughs> It's red, anyway. Brad. It's a brand. Oh. <laughs> Is he behind the camera? <laughs> no, Did he call us sick from the podcast today? <laughs> <laughs> That's sorry. <right. laughs> yeah. But they had a red flag. Sure. Still married today. Mm. Regret, regrets maybe that they didn't respond to that red flag. Wow. Ugh. Mm. Do, do, do I know this person? No, yeah, no, yeah, no, 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 because I'd rather be catching flights than feelings, right? So the problem, the problem is we're too busy catching feelings. So if you are not catching the red flag at that point because you're too busy up in your feelings because you're too lovey-dovey and you don't see the fact that they are narcissistic, that they have said certain things to you and, you're, and you just fob it off 
But for me, I remember when I was going through it, it was because I just was like, he would never do that to me. Mm. I'm t- you're too busy creating <laughs> the, the, f- the, the, the fairy world of what marriage looks like when the reality is we know marriage is hard, right? Because too many people are busy thinking about the wedding day. Mm. And not the marriage. Yeah. Nice. That's and that's why. Like and that. you like always, that. right? Yeah. We all want to have the beautiful wedding day. But let me tell you, maybe a week later, you're both at each other because you only worried about the wedding mm. and not worried about your goals and how you were going to do this and that and all of that stuff. So the red flag is pretty much, let's not dedicate it to the one day. Dedicate it to your mm. lifetime of mm. how things are going to look like. Yeah. And um, if you're not on the same page, well, then... Maybe that's the thing. We're too busy because we've got these expectations. People are just like, oh my gosh, they're such a great couple, right? We're too busy maybe trying to fulfill everyone else's expectations, yeah. but not your very own expectation mm. and the standards that you want to live up to. Obviously, there's a lot of people that say women have high standards. No, they just have standards. There's nothing about this high, low, whatever. If you want to have a good woman, make sure that she does have standards because if she goes along with whatever you decide as a man, mm. that's a red flag. Mm. And vice versa. Yeah. Super. Don't do not do this whole thing of just like, oh, it's 50-50, shut up. <laughs> <laughs> oh, whatever you, know, you so, want, babe. Oh, oh whatever you God. want. But yeah, but I'm just like, no, there is nothing wrong with standards. Standards is, um, they're considered like boundaries. Mm. They're protection for you. Identity. And identity. Yeah. They, are, they, they literally will help you level up. Mm. as a person yeah. rather than having to be the because what again another slogan right they say if you don't stand for anything you yeah, will fall for, for anything, anything. Yeah. right so it's that whole thing it's again it's true as cheesy as those sayings are though i mean yeah women and men just need to make sure that you are not fulfilling other people's expectations because mm. i feel often sometimes when people get married is because we um you know the the family mm. we're like oh well you're a good match a good match where? What, just because you physically look good together? Mm. But let me tell you, physical will never, ever no. surpass mm. the, the the pure grit and determination and the hard work that a marriage has to sustain, mm. right? Ooh. It isn't just that you look like yeah, Barbie yeah. and Ken, <laughs> uh, but then over here you look like Smeagol and... Um, <laughs> <laughs> and in front of, in front of, in front of. <laughs> so, you know, so it's one of those things. It's like just expectations are so built up in us, unfortunately, within our Pacific culture mm. of, of how we should be um, only because someone else said. And look, don't get me wrong. There are many a match made in heaven from, from mm. those things. But it's like, this is the thing. It's not everybody's story, though. Yeah. Everybody's mm. story is different. Everybody's fight to hold their marriage, to keep their marriage looks different. And so... We shouldn't just be like, well, they got through it, so you should get through it. Mm, yeah. <laughs> Some people, I mean, literally, and not to say that just because I was, you know, I, I broke up with my with my husband, with my ex-husband, but yeah, it just I just feel like if we, and I think I've said this about other people, if we can afford people grace and forgiveness, um, I feel like people will end up with the right person. It's good, man. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Yeah, that's some good gems. That's some good gems, man. Especially around people's expectations, man. Yeah, because it plays a big, plays into a lot of the pressure of um, wanting to find someone, sure, get married, and then you see them just struggling um, Mm. through the whole journey, you know. And I've I just made up a slogan while we were just talking. I was like, <laughs> everyone prepares for the event, not the everlasting. <laughs> <laughs> oh, bro, wow. bro. <laughs> that man. I like what my pastor says. He yeah, says, yeah, yeah. you're better to wait 20 years for the right one than be with the wrong person for... Oh, no. I said it wrong. Damn but I, it. <laughs> you know what I said? I, but I get you. Right, I get right. you. Yeah. And it is. Look, let me tell you. There has been situations where me and, and, and some other girls that I were good friends, that we've all gone through the abuse. Excuse mm. me. But we've all viewed it and gone through it, Different. reacted it, reacted to it differently. Mm. So I became promiscuous. One became really like pff, off men, Right. Mm. So even though we had different ways, but I had said to, so now that we've come through our healing and all of that stuff, um, 
it's the waiting, right? So I didn't know how to wait, so I just went with whoever, <laughs> right? And she just has waited forever and still to this day, you know, that type of thing. It's just like, well, there's still no one in, in that person's life. Does that mean either or, look, we're both with nobody, right? So it's just whatever way you take life, yes, it will happen, but I just think we shouldn't have to put then the pressure on someone, right? It's the pressure of just like, well, they've waited for 40 years and now there's someone who has come into their yeah. life and I may have not waited 40 years, then all of a sudden someone magically comes into my life. So however it works, it works. Mm. That's good. But it should, it, but that's the beauty of your story, right? Like, because if we all had the same story, it just would be really boring, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Um, but kudos to the ladies that wait though. Mm. I, For me, that's my thing. I, I've told many other women, I've said to them, I've never known what the art of waiting was. So can you imagine if I did, mm. what my life would have been? I think it would have been different, but my life didn't happen that way. Mm. And I think when our stories are different, it, uh, then, uh, then it tells other people that life is not perfect. Mm. And why I say that is because we are caught up now in this day and age of having to try and look like we are perfect online. Mm. So when we all are trying to look perfect online, what else are you left with though? Mm. Yeah. And so my thing is I hate having to try and be perfect online. I literally share all my drama and my, you know, but not to a point to just be like, you know, because I remember, man, remember that saying where they say, face your problems, don't Facebook them. <laughs> oh, <really? laughs> when you guys come up with this? I know, song, but when I saw it online, I'd be like, again, shut up. Because you know what, again, it's, my, our generation is different to this generation. Mm. So that is sometimes how people share their issues. Mm. But then again, people Facebook their issues because again, let's try and see past what they're trying to say online. People are crying out yeah. to try and get a bit of attention for someone to say, hey, are you all right? Mm. That's when you check in, yeah. <laughs> right? That's the moment when you should check in. Mm. Not the reader and scroll by and go like, and then carry on. Yeah. <laughs> well, oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but this is why it's like, why do we have thousands of friends? Well, some people, or Pity, you probably have like 4,000 yeah, friends not, on Facebook. Not, you probably got like a big following. Yeah, you know, like, but why do we have thousands of followers? But yet we probably don't even know half of them. Mm. And then you've got people who would say, I'll be there for you, but mm. uh, I've never heard from you, you know. So I just, I'm very much the big on this whole thing about just always being intentional about whatever it is that you put your mouth to, whatever you put your words to, whatever, wherever you walk, be intentional about it because you're going to be wasting so much of your time and life. Mm. And we all know. We've probably had wasted years, wasted days, wasted it. <laughs> so, yeah, I just think I don't want to waste any more time. And I think that's probably maybe that comes with age because I'm now in my 40s and I just honestly feel like I just don't have time to waste. Like if you say you're going to catch up, then let's catch up. But if you're not, then don't even bother. Like, And I know for me, I, should, I don't want to throw words out and just flippantly say, hey, you know, um, I've been thinking about you, and you know what I think it is. What comes? Well, no, what comes down to is a lot of this because as a single parent, mm. I've seen so many people. <laughs> you know, the whole just like, please go and help out the 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 orphans and the widows, and you know all of that stuff. Like we can become very um, surgically undo what is biblical because we just want the gram to look at us and know that we're going to go help a single mother. I am going to. Big to anyone that is watching this, please stop showing videos about how what good you're doing. I don't know. I'm sorry. It just it annoys me. That's just my take on it. I'm just like, just do it behind closed doors. Go and help someone just for the sake of helping someone. Mm. We don't. I don't need a camera in somebody's face. I don't. That homeless person didn't ask for you to come with your yeah, camera and good. say to me, "Hey, I just." Do you know what I mean? Yeah. There are just some things that we get so caught up because of a trend, but it's just like doing good should never go out of style. So then why are you trying to bring it back into trend online? doesn't need an audience. It doesn't need an audience. People who are down and out don't need an audience because yeah. they're just trying to get through life. And for the life of me, I've seen many a times people just trying to use someone's misfortune for their gain. Mm. And it's like, why? 
And I just, yeah, for me, I'm just like, just go help the person because you said you're going to go help them. And it's not good anymore. When you start said, taping it and you start putting Oh, it look, online. I get it. Look, look, don't do, I've seen many online where, yes, it's beautiful to watch. I mm. get it. I don't know. But maybe, if that was the I purpose just, maybe of I just, doing it. Yeah, but that's what I'm saying. If the intention is always just like, I don't know, because I know some people are going to try and misconstrue this no, but of what I'm this. saying. It's just please understand. Oh, yeah. People need help because they need help, not because you need views. Mm, like so that. if we go back to that's why good. they're doing that, why are they posting that? Is it because they're trying to model good behavior? Are they trying to I get show this. people how to be kind? Yeah, but this is the thing, right? Like without <clears> any <throat> of this, what we would never, would we have still done this conversation? And mm. do you know what I mean? Sometimes mm. you like, this is Good why point. children or young people don't say anything. It's because oh, if it's not if it's not alive, I don't want to, <laughs> I don't want to mm. be in your. You know what I mean? Yeah. I won't talk about anything unless it's alive. Mm. I mean, like mm. it, it, it just yeah. yeah. There are just some things where intention and the purpose of something can still be great. And remember, when we had no social media, there mm. was still the power of word and the the, the power of our mouths of just telling someone else, hey, did you hear about somebody yeah. did this good thing? You know, it's always just like, yeah, we are, we are caught up in a generation that wants to just, I don't know, like just uh, be all about the views but not enough about the actual help that you want to give somebody. Mm. So great. for me, often sometimes I'm very much like, it's nice to watch, but it just is like, what is the purpose of it? Um, would you still help someone without the camera? Well, that's, a, yeah. that's a real good point. Without uh, the likes? That's a, that's a real good point, the, man. Because you, you, you're right, Agnes, because you, you see them all the time. You see them on Facebook, you see them on YouTube, Instagram, all these guys going around giving money to the poor or all this inst- or giving food to them and all that kind of stuff. Oh, man, or give them give them cash. Oh, here, cash for you. Yeah. If you. And so they're, obviously they're looking for some sort of reaction, but would they still do it? You're right. You're absolutely right. Would they have still done it without the cameras? There probably is people who would still do it. I get that. Don't get yeah. me wrong. But, you know, like I said, I'm very much not the person that I don't want to be um, caught up in trends. But then I don't know how to set my... Um, there's a thing about, yes, you want to be a trendsetter. Absolutely, right? Yeah. But if you are just too busy being a trendsetter... Um, and then you're still a dick to the person next to you. You know, that's that whole thing. It's just like... Don't try and look all glorious over here, um, but you can't treat your mother really nicely mm. or something like, do you know what I mean? Yeah. There's just often yeah. sometimes yeah. you don't really know how someone is because you're only seeing them on what's on what's online. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Share the best hope. Yeah, we, yeah. Or, yeah. <laughs> look at you in your lines. <laughs> <laughs> King Slogan. Hey, nah, they're all we, coming we, we, out. We, we. <laughs> <laughs> slogan. That's why he was clicking before. He was trying to get us out. <laughs> My man. <laughs> But yeah, I just, so uh, I don't even know how we came down this path of conversation. <laughs> no, it's but just, yeah. interesting. But that's yeah. so it's really good, interesting. Because you're testing my judgment, daughters. <laughs> you know, like you're testing but my... But see, when we have this conversation, it does. Everything yeah. we say should be able to be like, it Reflection. allows you to check yourself. Yeah. yeah. Because you often think what you're doing is all good until someone says, but have you thought about this? And, and I've had that many conversations. Someone has said something to me and I'm like, oh, shit. Yeah, like, yeah, here I'm thinking I'm some martyr, eh? Like, yeah. trying to be thou art again, um, you know, Mother Teresa, when really I'm not. I wasn't mm. geared for, for Mother Teresa to go feed children. Like, do you know what I mean? I'm not all of a sudden going to turn around and start going and taking, um, you know, meal preps <laughs> down to the homeless because all of us, you know, I, I, that's not my lane. <laughs> Hey, but I feel like often some of us get caught up in trends mm. in, in, in the world of social media because, oh, that person's doing Maybe we can do it. And mm. then we start filming ourselves. What For what, though? Mm. Like, f- I just have to always question why you are doing what you're doing. But if we come back to what That's you were cool. saying earlier, right? The <laughs> chickens, they have this intention, but then they don't do it. Mm. I mean, maybe the positive way to look at this is they're doing it. Absolutely. You know, they're doing it even with cameras or whatever, but they've sure. done something good. Yeah. And who am I to say that it's not good, but they've done something. <laughs> yeah. You know, we're talking about the lack of behaviour. Mm. Today's day and age, it looks like we can't do anything without these things all being on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like mm. we now live in this big brother world yeah. that in order for us to do – and, you know, that's ego. And we, I quite often mm. get told ego is not good, but – Hold on, we all have egos and sometimes ego Absolutely makes us we do. do things. How weird was, I mean, I was just at home yesterday and I was going to my daughter, oh my gosh, I need to post this up. And then I thought to myself, 
why do I need to post this up? I, because it's been a hectic week before we leave, right? And I haven't posted anything up. It was like, where in the world have all of a sudden I've become this person where I have to post something? Because it's like, did it, you know, you and what was say, your answer? No, and this is what I laughed. I go to me, it was just that, when, when did I ask? You know, like, <laughs> when did I ask you, Aggie, that you have to put something up in order for the world to know? Mm. Like, what if the world didn't know that my last day of work was last Friday? What is actually going to happen to the world if they didn't know about their day? And I realised I still posted it up. <laughs> See, that's the thing because I get because I get so caught up, right? Because I live, I work in the world of media, yeah. and and then I try to rationalise. Mm. Oh, because I work in the world of media, I should post something oh, up sense. so that the world knows. But in my in my head, though, I sat there and I even had to tell my daughter, "Oh my gosh, I have to post this up." But then I just caught myself thinking, "Why though?" Because there are parts of me, let me tell you, there are parts of my life I still have not put up online, even though I feel like maybe the majority of the world or whoever's my friends online um, know about my life. Mm. But, you know, there's still parts of me. There, Am I going to post about the fact that um, there were a lot of people that didn't know that we had a dog? But we've had that dog since it was eight weeks and now it's nine months. And only tonight did we have to rehome her. Oh. And so before here, I was telling, you know, that I was like bawling my eyes, but I have not once ever posted anything about my dog. Why? Because that was my therapy dog when my mum passed away. Mm. I needed something. I needed a comfort besides Jesus. But do you know what I mean? In that sort of physical format, it couldn't be a man, so it had to be a dog. <laughs> 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 so, you know, that's what I mean. It's like, why didn't I post up anything about my dog? It's because it was one thing that was so precious to me. Mm. And that's mm. often what I mean. And in the world is often we just throw pearls to the swine. We just throw anything out. Mm. We just It's like we need everybody to know about ourselves. But you know what? There are parts of ourselves that not everybody has to mm. know about. Yeah. And I know you all understand that. Yeah. So you're but saying um, I don't need to know why. <laughs> Uh, no, I, wh oh, no, why I put it up? Is it, yeah, no, no, no. I knew why I put it up. Mm. It's because but I wanted to... you don't to need to know. Yeah, no, 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 She's saying it in a nice <laughs> way. <laughs> you only need to know why I put it up. None of your business, none of your business. None of your business. That's all right. That's all right. I just wanted to know why. No, I know why I put it up. Oh, do you mean, sorry, about my dog or about um the my last day at work? Yeah, because you had that reflection around why, why do I have to put this up? Why do I, it was but because I wanted to no, so I put it up only because it's because I wanted to acknowledge the people at work. So mm. you know, you do that thing where you tag people because specifically mm. you wanted to say something. See, as if I didn't want to put anything up about my dog because that's personal to me. That's mm. just me. Mm. No one knows how I feel when I'm with my dog. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. So it's like no one else needs to know that. So there okay. are things where yes, I want to put it up because of the sake it's you wanting yeah. to honor people or whatever milestone. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It was a very big milestone but yeah i just think if anything just make sure your intentions are yeah, yeah. uh do you know what I, mean? I agree right. yeah. totally it's agree. good to check ourselves and test even the way you said like <laughs> if there was no cameras here would we still have this yeah. same that's conversation, quite, conversation that's quite confronting yeah <laughs> yeah 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 because you know oh, when was the last time we saw you <laughs> but that's 2002. the thing yeah but yeah, no, no 2012. 2012. Oh, sorry, 2012 oh my gosh yeah still but oh, i saw her this year <laughs> <laughs> Let's not try and justify it. Yeah, but she can come to your house. <laughs> but it is, it is, yeah. it is confronting. It is, yeah. it is, I love it. I love you how you brought it up, um, Agnes, because you're right. Yeah. W without these cameras, would we still have this conversation? Would, would you we, still have invited Agnes? Would we still get uh, Agnes on board and, and, and have this conversation because you go to ABC and all that kind of stuff in Australia? Uh, it's well, it, it, is, it, is, it is. I think it's... it's so, something that we need to talk about because, you know, I think if anything, it really kind of shows the the intention around someone's heart or the agenda or, or um, whatever, uh, the purposes. Mm. Like, I think you you said it perfectly. The purpose, and I think it's um, it is. I think it, to be honest, when I think about it, man, relationships are important. Yeah. Like this is what comes to my mind is we are caught up in a world where people only want to know you when all of a sudden you've done really well. Like, and don't get me wrong, I'm not saying this is a thing here, but it just often, right? Like, oh, when someone's become an Olympic mm. medalist, all of a sudden we want to be their friend and we want to interview them. Like, I know that I'm caught up in that. Like, that's the world I come from, right? Like, not often do we just want to interview the guy that's washing the windows at the at the lights. I've never seen any of them on my show, right? Why would I want to interview them? I have to question myself often. But I'm more than happy to in invite maybe the gold medalist, like, you know, Dame 
Valerie Adams. Mm. Mm. Why? Because she's won, she's done a movie, she's done a documentary. She's gone through the struggle though. But this is my thing. I'm not going to interview the cleaners down the road. It's just, mm. I have to keep questioning myself why I'm doing what I'm doing. Mm. And I want to make sure that I'm in a space where if I'm going to tell somebody's story, it is that it's at any point of your life that you matter. Because that's often why people don't think that they matter. Because they only think they matter until they've made it. Mm. Yeah. But what does making it mean? Mm. Good, yeah. good, 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 because I don't think I've made it. I'm going to ABC, that's cool. Yeah. But I don't think I've made it. Not even close. Mm. I just know that's part of my journey. Yeah. And it's going to open up a doorway more so for my children. Not just because <laughs> I've stepped up maybe, or people say I've leveled up from, from 531PI. If I had any choice, I'd... I love my job. I love what I was doing here. But I have to see opportunities, right? Mm. I have to think about my children and the life that I want to leave them. It means that I have to go to a greater platform. Yeah. But it um, doesn't mean I've made it at all. That's yes. good. That's good. That's why so. we've asked the window washer to come tonight. <laughs> <laughs> I guess when you're leaving it, should we ask the guy down the road? Yeah. Should we ask the guy who's on? No cameras. Yeah, no cameras. Tonight we have the best one to watch at the... So it might demand, but no cameras, because we just want to be in teaching. But it's making you think, though, isn't it? No, it's all the things. It's like... We only invite sometimes certain people yeah, for yeah. whatever reason. It's not to say that you have bad intentions, yeah. but I think sometimes we just can trip ourselves up yeah. Yeah. over not knowing really what's the true purpose, reason, um, you know, that we should be able to talk to anybody. Because Yeah, so I often feel like that's why people feel unseen is because we've labelled them as an unseen type of person. And, yeah. Yeah, that's a, that's sure good, sis. man. That's a good sis. <laughs> uh, you know, when you talk about the labels and all that kind of stuff. Um, and then we talk about, you know, obviously your, your life and your journey thus far, Agnes. But while you're waiting in the wings, <laughs> weren't you, obviously for this this man? Because I don't know, I'm, I'm, thinking, I'm, thinking, I'm thinking in my mind while we're kind of talking, having this conversation, and whoever sees this or watches this, is like, <laughs> man, gosh, who is this lady? She's amazing. <laughs> And it's just uh, obviously she's got you know, her, her journey thus far is just, just incredible, but I, I don't know. I just have a feeling that someone out there is going to make my gosh, this lady's incredible. Wow! And so if, if, if I'm saying I'm saying this, I don't know. Good luck. I don't want to speak anything into existence. Maybe, maybe so, but. Is well, they well, say yeah. manifesting? Yeah, 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 yeah. I was going to say it's anything it's else, just in case. That's another cliche. All I know is that God's been there for you before. He's going to be there yes, with you at right. the end. So. It's but, called nudging. Yeah, but, 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 yeah, but why, are you, why, why are you waiting? Why are you waiting? Why are you waiting, um, Agnes? Yeah. Because um, I, I, I've heard it time and time again, ladies and, and men have, yeah. have this specific list. Mm. Why are you waiting? Is there a certain certain type or criteria that this man has to kind of fulfill mm. or, or be to mm. like man I, I would consider this man i would consider this guy is there something that in, you, in your mind like oh, yeah, this, 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 is, this is the guy this is the guy right well let's see from the last three <laughs> <laughs> as they have been quite a bit of a failure <laughs> i believe i can't <laughs> Compare, um, but oh my gosh, uh, what would I expect? See, the funny thing is, as cliche as this sounds, and as whatever, he has to love God. I'm sorry, I'm just going to have to say that. And not to say that any of the others did not. There is something where I believe someone who is absolutely in love with the creator who made them in order to know um, what was taken from their rib is exactly what is going to be the matchup. Um, and obviously, yeah, we all know a woman were f was formed out of the man's rib. I just feel someone who, and you know, I, and as cheesy as this sounds, it's, I need someone who is real gutsy. I need someone who is able to um, speak in authority. I'm very much like I, that's what I find attractive as someone. You know, just for, okay, so Tinder, swipe. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I just, I feel like that's it. I feel, and I feel that way now because of what I've gone through. And I understand what it takes to have to um, 
not expect, not even want, but just to know that that is the man that is going to, I wouldn't say if, when, when that person comes into my life. And I'm not, but again, like I said, it's not that I need a man to complete me. When that happens, it'll happen. But I'm not bothered. Mm. I'm really not bothered. Right? Like I believe I can live my days out just as me. Because, again, it's not about me. It's what I'm going to see after me. And that's the legacy. So still, uh, if I was to have a man that comes into my life, again, gutsy, loyal, um, who can speak truth, um, speak in authority. Uh, yeah, that sort of seems to be the things. I don't know what it is. I just need someone who absolutely loves music, eh, also. <laughs> but see, I tried that. <laughs> <laughs> He was just I before his time. Be, yeah, yeah, So, you know. Yes, yeah, but, I give you, <laughs> but I just need someone honestly. I don't know what it is because music just does something. Like, if you are uh, creative in that sense, too, um, I honestly believe the other person has to be creative in a sense. Um, has to be good with money. Mm. Uh, that would be like a <laughs> standard, I think, for me. I've always told my kids, hey, finance before romance. So, <laughs> if you're going to learn anything out of my mistakes, I would say, and people just say, you know, I think that can be silly to some people, but man, it's not even a balangi concept. That is a standard. Like, that is be good with what you have in your hands. And for me, unfortunately, for the times that I've seen and the, the, the relationships I've had, uh, they have not been that way. Um, and that obviously has caused many issues. So for me, I believe, honestly, if, 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 if uh, when I find a man, that he is good with money. Mm. Not to say that he's a hoarder, uh, but that he knows when and where things need to go. Yeah. That's good. Where that money needs to be going. So Shut that's just some of so it. I'm just going to ask Brad to turn that into a snippet and I'll send it to my daughter. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Yeah, yeah. And I think, yeah. I think a lot of men would appreciate that, um, Agnes, because your standards, I think, hey, hey, Charles, would you agree, like, in terms of us as men, and even in Brad, uh, um, just, I'm just saying, like, the standards, because you talk about standards and values. I yeah. think a lot of men would appreciate women who have, who have standards and values, like, wow, who would kind of, like, kind of just go through the trenches with you and, and as you know, as, as, a, as a spouse or as a partner. And you're just saying someone who's gutsy, someone who's mm. outspoken, someone who's creative, but someone who loves God. And that's, mm. in, in, your, in your experience now, even with, with your son and other men that you've, you've met mm. or you converse with, do you see that or do you think that's, that's, that's lacking in, in our men in this day and age or do you see that quite often? Men who are godly, but men who are quite outspoken and, and cura courageous. What are, what are your thoughts? Because I'm thinking, man, because I'm, 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 I'm praying, I'm hoping that this, whoever sees us, like, my gosh, this lady is, <laughs> this lady is 100% legit. Oh, and so do, do you, thanks. do you see, like, in, in your experiences, do you mm. see, are we lacking that, those kind of um, values as men, or is it still quite prevalent, still, still quite strong in this day and age? Well, chivalry is sometimes, you know, a lost art form. And I, <laughs> and I have still continued to teach my son to open the door um, for me mm. and open the door for his kingi, open the door for any woman. And why I say that is because, you know, sometimes we think that uh, old ways are old ways and it's like, oh, I know what to do now, I know how to be a man, da 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 all of that stuff. But unfortunately... Let's be honest, there is a generation of us who have not been brave enough to instill that to the next generation. Mm. Uh, the way men are now is because we didn't do our job and we have to take ownership for that. But at the same time, that doesn't mean that it's not capable, we aren't capable to still teach and train our young men to be good men. Um, yeah, I think with... it's. Uh, what I see with my son and his friends, because he's got, because he's a dancer, and so heaps of boys, they're dancers. Um, and I've seen a lot of them all with their girlfriends come over. Um, yeah, I wish I can see a lot of it is uh, just so too much caught up in in feels, and uh, you want substance, right? There's nothing wrong with substance, not illegal substances. Oof. You want substance where 
<laughs> where the men are solid enough to know that um, it's all right to have a strong woman too, right? Like there's, but at the same time, not we are not all created the same. So I just think if we're wanting um wanting to raise men, good godly men too, then just be real. Like stop faking the funk, and th- and throwing scripture online. <laughs> <laughs> Stop throwing your scriptures online, but yet you can't pick up the phone and call and check in on how that young person is. Mm. Uh, f- to the death of me, that has been done online. People are so quick to put so many scriptures online, but you can't go and feed the homeless yourself. Like, it just makes sure. Do you know what I mean? Like, yeah. that's the yeah. thing. It's the same thing with men. You want to raise good men? Then go and be in their lives and mm. speak into their lives. What is this whole thing about just busy being a keyboard warrior, about you complaining about young men who are doing ram raids and all of this shit, right, that we are consumed by, but you are not doing anything mm. but just complaining online? Mm. Let me tell you, the war will never be won in the comment section. <laughs> so give it up. Stop. Like, what is the point? Just go, if you see a need, just go and fulfill the need. Mm. See the change, be the change. All of these slogans that you are so good at, you know, it, but it is, when it comes down to it, it's just like, just stop saying shit. Just go do shit, yeah. Yeah. right? Because we say, again, you know, um, action without, you know, faith without works, right? It's, it's, it's that whole thing. Ah, yeah, well, we can talk about faith to it till the cows come home. But if you're not acting out your faith and really just like so people can see that, oh, Oh, is that how that works? Like, I mean, faith to me isn't that, um, you know, when they keep saying you've got to have big faith, big faith to do this, blah, blah, blah. Let me tell you, the faith as small as a mustard seed has been able to move mountains in my life. And I love this. I saw, and I saw, saw this slogan, but I saw this quote on, online. And it just really, honestly, depicts my life of where I come from, guys. Like, let me tell you, if there was, if uh, the saying was, if you were holding on, to a thread, let it be the hem of Jesus' garment. And that has been my life. Like I have had to hold on just to the thread, the, you know, the bare minimum in my life to get through. So for me, it tells me that faith isn't just about the big faith. It is that I have had faith and I've only just held on with that little piece of string. And so that's why I'm very big about this whole thing about mustard seed and and what it does and how it can move mountains. And because God has moved mountains in order for me to be able to walk and and sit in places that I never thought I would be able to. I never thought I'd be able to sit in a space and speak and interview prime ministers, you know, MPs, politicians, um, you know, prime ministers from overseas. Like I have been afforded things that I know not everyone would ever be able to sit in a space and, and do. And so I don't take that lightly. I take that with um, with the weight of what my parents came over here with, right? Like they fought for me to at least be in the space now that I can speak freely because they never got to. It's amazing. Yeah. Wow, no. That's cool. And you're doing that for so many other yeah. generations. Yeah. Man. That's yeah. awesome. Love it. <laughs> That's, man. Yeah. I, I don't know. No I think like that's it. a good... That that's so powerful that you know adding any more to it yeah. Yeah, would um I don't know, but I just feel um <laughs> I just do want to go back to like the season of saying yes. Mm. Yeah. Have you always been a person that's said yes? No. Okay. You uh, able to talk about? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Unfortunately, no. Uh yeah, look, let me tell you, there was a point in my life where I, and now that I've seen, when I look back at the choices I've made, I said yes to a lot of bad things, right? So, yes, maybe I've said yes to a lot of things, but not to the right things. The season that I'm in now to say yes is purely, let me roll back again. Um, yes to me was actually quite bad. I had said yes to so many bad things that I equated it to it, um, to being like a prostitute. Because, right, I gave my, I gave my body away to anyone, so I would say yes to anybody, and so I hated the word yes, and then only when I came through healing, part of my life now, to understand that saying yes in this season is because I know who I finally am, 
So I think that will always be my thing. Until people say, they always be like, what's your why, right? I don't agree with that. You can't find your why until you know who you are. Mm. And so for me, that has always been my thing is, once you know who you are, then you can have your why. But a lot of times we've thrown that out to people, find your why, find your why, what, to a whole lot of people that are lost and don't even know, right? Like, that's that thing again, let's not throw words out just for the sake of throwing words out. So um, me saying yes now in the season is only because I know who I am. And I've said yes a lot in this last season uh, because it's not just about me. I need to keep seeing beyond me. And that is my two children and the children they're going to have. I really am, I wouldn't be doing any, I would be, I would be doing a disservice to my children if I was just thinking about myself. So yes means I know who I am. Yes means I'm excited for the new season. Yes means God is in control. Mm -hmm. That's why. He's in control, ultimate control. Because I've been too busy trying to be in control. So I finally have said yes to allowing him to take me where I need to be. Yeah, because if this was me 15, 20 years ago, I would never have known what that is to say yes. It has been such an ease, this next chapter. And I've never experienced anything like that. So this is why I know it's God. Mm. Yes. Yeah. Cool. That's powerful. I'm sorry, just one more. So just go, one more. go, go. So I feel there's a lot of young women that might come across this podcast, mm. this episode, and it might be a God-given thing mm. at a time that where they have been unseen or unheard. And, and so for you, sis, when you think about the younger Aggie, maybe the one 20, 23 years ago, mm. knowing what you know now, what would you like to say to her? <laughs> Are you mm. trying to make me cry? <laughs> <laughs> what would I say to her? I don't know what this keeps coming through, but uh, keep showing up. Mm. Keep showing up because uh, you're worth it. Um, poor. <laughs> uh, what would I say to Aggie? You are enough. Mm. What would I say to her? Not your fault. Mm. Mm. And I only say that, that it's not your fault in the sense of certain things that happened to yeah. me. Um, yeah, but that uh, if I was to turn around and say something to her, I'd be like, you're enough. Um, just keep showing up. Keep showing up for the sake of, um, for the sake of my story being told because, like I've said to you before, yeah, there are heaps of girls out there that haven't had their story been told. Um, one, because we're t uh, too afraid to let go of our pride, our ego. Um, and that no one can be the hero of your story but you. Besides Jesus, you know. <laughs> but there, I, I, yeah, I just believe that no one can be honestly, can tell the story better than than you. And I'm so grateful that I sit in this space now and I get to tell my story mm. because I know I've lost many a friends along the way who never got to tell their story. So I just hope that whatever I do with my voice and the platform that I've been given, yeah, that it would raise the next generation to just do so much better than any of us, yeah. right? Mm. Like, we're not going to just sit here in this room here. We're going to be in platforms and places um, that we thought only over there could do. Yeah. Mm. Beautiful. <laughs>
Beautiful. Sorry, oh, I just <laughs> so much to say, but I'm like gonna yeah. rein it in. Mm. Powerful. I like that. Just show up. Just yeah, keep, keep showing, showing up. up. It's, yeah. it's hard to show up when um, yeah, when the world just keeps telling you so much shit, right? Yeah, like you need to be this person, you need this person, but um, yeah, sometimes we obviously just need to shut yeah online and <laughs> yeah get in line with yourself and Ooh. try and figure out that oh. first. Stop yeah. it! Stop it! Man. Stop. <laughs> I've always said uh, I'm using that to hey, When you fall this all this yeah, yeah I'll give you another one. <laughs> when, you, yeah, when you fall in line, God is on time. Mm. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> and that's it. Yeah. Too <laughs> much, so, man. Yeah. Thank you so much. Oh like, good. Just wanna honor you. Like, <laughs> honestly. Um it's been you're being a breath of uh, fresh air, um, in terms of you being you. Um you you know, we throw around the word wahine toa or, <laughs> but um you are someone that's um really toa to the bone in terms of um your story and your testimony um your journey um what you want for your children and the generations to come and not only for your 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 family but to <laughs> to um other generations to our people to yep. People of the Pacific um, wanting to be that platform um, to advocate for those who are voiceless. Mm. Those who might feel disabled and what they're going through right now and may not, may find it hard to show up. And and you've given, um, you've been an example of someone that's um, gone through it. They've seen the, the seas, a glimmer of light and you might not, have it all together but you're still working through it you're mm. still showing up and i love your realness i love <laughs> mm. some of the things that you've challenged and um, made us think about made me think about in terms of uh, things we throw out um, our intentionality and, mm. and everything that we do and i just want to thank you <laughs> thank mm. you and uh, i also want to just because uh, we're always you know the thing that when we sit down with people is that um, it humanizes them. It really tells us uh, we want people to feel valued that you're more than the yeah. platform you come with or the mm. title or how people perceive you that there's a person. And um, and I, yeah, I love the person that we've met and, <laughs> and um, I can't wait to see uh, the journey unfold. I can't wait for this king to turn up into your life and really treat you like the queen that Thank you, you are. <laughs> um, and you know we, you know we're we're, we're people of faith, and mm. and we won't just you know say it here, but we will continue to pray <laughs> for you. you and your kids, and and know that you know you've said it yourself. You're mm. in line. God's in time. Yes, <laughs> and, amen. And amen. so um, yeah. bless you, sis. I think this is the most we've talked about faith. On this podcast, oh, wow, and this, beautiful man, and it's not that we've tried to like, no, you know, force it or we'll try to just, um, just I guess, yeah. just talk about it for the sake of it. No, it's something that's just organically happened, yeah. organically yeah. happened, yes. and it's you. Yeah. yeah, this is this is something that's been a part of who you are and mm. who it makes. And I'm talking here, but I just want because you're going, you're taking <laughs> off over me. across the sea and we won't be able to um, have these conversations. But yeah, True. just really blessed to sit down with you on our table and can't wait. You know, when you visit, yes. make sure you come and see us. So yes, we will intentionally come out and see you. <laughs> exactly. we, exactly. come, we might come with one camera and like, oh, nah. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, just bless you, sis. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much for tonight, man. And so I I I don't know what I was expect I didn't expect this, Talanoa. I did not expect this <laughs> yeah. level of depth. Mm. I didn't um I didn't know about any of the stuff that you I didn't know anything about your um life journey. It's powerful. So powerful. Um and so I just wish you the best. Thank you. I wish that you you just that you represent our people um, mm. in the mainstream. You, know, you be in the mainstream and you just keep doing what you know is right for you. Mm. You know, 
I love that you've shared your story of restoration, recovery, mm. growth, all of that. And I, I love what you've shared as well. Like you've shared a journey where you've had to fight, you've had to survive, and you've um, found a place where this is who I am now. Mm. That's powerful. So powerful for the many people out there that are trapped yeah. in that trauma. Mm. Trapped because somebody took something from them. You've shown them that you can get other things. Even if you can't get that back, there's other things that you can get instead yeah. that's allowed you to grow through this. Um, and I just think it's such a powerful story. Thank you so much for sharing that with us. Thank you. Um, I'm probably going to sit on this for the next <laughs> month. There's so much in it. So much um, reflection, so much learning. Mm. Um, but thank you for opening up this conversation for our uh, wahine, for our teine. Mm. Really important. So important to model this conversation. Um, but so important, if that's the statistics out there, you bring the hope that they need to see mm. Mm. and what they can do with that. Um, so, so, so hopeful too. Yeah. So hopeful, man. Wow. Smash it while you're over there. We'll do. <laughs> Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, you very so much. much. Yeah. Maro lover. Maro lover, Agnes. Uh, okay. just, it is, it is, it, tonight's been a real honour. Like, you, I, you know, I say to every guest that comes on, it's been a real honour, a real privilege. Mm. But tonight has been, uh, like like Caroline and Charles, I didn't know what to expect. I thought, okay, cool, we're just going to be cool, tell Noah. <laughs> yeah. We're going to have a good conversation. But you, um, just the, just the level of re- resilience, the level of resilience, the level of courage that's beyond of in, any person, ordinary person. Thank you. For you to display that and to go through all these things, these, you know, quite horrific, if you think about it, quite horrific events, mm. and still come out and say, hey, I'm okay, I'm good. I, I love God. I still love men. There's some men out there yeah. who are good. I mean, obviously, because we think this man is, man is a, a, a <laughs> you know, men. Yeah. But, man, just... I can guarantee, I can guarantee a lot of people who are listening, a lot of men who, and women who are watching this mm. are going to be so so enlightened and so enriched by this conversation. Mm. You know, some of the things that you've brought up and, uh, and obviously we, we kind of look back and think, man, it's just not uncommon. It's mm. not uncommon, some of, the, some of the things that our people are going through. Yeah. And for you to share that is going to bring a lot of healing. I, I can guarantee a lot of healing and uh, a lot of a lot of testing, a lot of, of critical thinking, but also a lot of... <laughs> A lot of um, you know, conversational starters. I think people are going to really appreciate this. And so, sis, all the best, all the best. We're, we're, we're very proud. And the only reason why we got here, here because I, I said, hey, man, we need to get, we need to get this we need to get this lady. She's doing some amazing work. Thank Besides you. ABC, you, you were always on the radar anyway, regardless if you're going there uh, to Australia. But what a journey! What a journey thus far. And mm. uh, I can guarantee it's going to be just just even more beautiful as, as it un- unfolds. And so, please. You good men out there, you good godly men out <laughs> there, guy, so, yeah. courageous men out there who love yeah. God, who are good with finances. Yeah. Hey, that's why it's called mandate. Yeah. Yes, there we go. If you can find a man, yeah, man, don't, don't, don't. If you got drama with well. your mama, don't be coming over here. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I reckon. Maro, maro, yeah. pitu, maro, yeah. pitu. Um, sis, yeah, we're very proud. We're very proud of, of your work. Thank you. And, and yeah, for many years we mm. heard you on, on the airwaves, and so yeah, yeah, for many yeah. years, yeah. And so, so soothing just to, just to hear your voice, but soothing even to be here in our midst. It's the I ninety eight if you love songs to midnight. Hey, it's their voice and clear. I tried to work on that for so clear? long. Hey, oh. it's like love songs to midnight. Man. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I just want to say thank you. Like, honestly, thank you so much for even considering me. I know that sometimes, uh, I mean, like, yeah, I'm on the other side. So I'm used to having to interview other people. So this is very much a, a new thing. Um, but I just am very grateful. Like, you guys have no idea. Like, I think when I first watched your guys' podcast and just what you guys were trying to aim for, like, please understand the scope and the length and breadth and width of the people that you are reaching like obviously we understand what mandate means but the and I know you're doing a bit of a play on the pun and, and, and all of that stuff but man to have men who really are setting the mandate for and like this then that's why I say like do not shy away from the standard that you guys are wanting to like give people to understand that we should be doing this a whole lot more men should be talking a whole lot more it is such an encouragement it's such a beautiful thing like my son watches you guys. 
Like, do you know what I mean? Like, that's a that's a generational transfer that I would love. You know, like understand that the conversations you talk about, whether it is with celebrities or everyday common people, there is something in each and every one of those conversations that you have that literally speaks life to someone who is probably considering something else. Mm-hmm. And if you know what you know what I mean. So just know it's life giving. It's so beautiful to have to have you guys do this. And it's so beautiful that you get to bring mm-hmm. our Wahi Neto over here too, that it has to be part of the, you know, this platform and stuff. And so please don't stop, you know, um, even if it is with cameras or not cameras. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like yeah. just yeah. keep doing what you need to do because we sit in this day and age where people just want to be seen. Mm. And uh, you are giving that platform for people to be seen so that other people can understand that their life matters. Mm, my yeah. own, my so own. thank you very much thank you, sis. for doing what you guys do. I appreciate it, but sis, yeah, we always so. our guests always uh, we always give them a gift and say um. <laughs> oh. So we yeah we always give a, a bit of a caricature of how we envision our guests. Oh, so on behalf of the mandate team, this is for you, sis. Oh uh, my no. goodness, am I? <gasps> Oh, I love it. It's beautiful. That eh? is so cool. It showed me earlier. I was like, oh, yes. that was beautiful. Uh, Oi, Malo you. Roses. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much. Yeah, I love thank you. thank you. This is beautiful. You know what's funny? I thought you were going to reach for the dumbbell. I was like, are you trying to hit something? <laughs> <laughs> hey, I was like, looking at me, going, we always have a gift, and I went, oh, <laughs> this guy is trying to say something. No, no. <laughs> Oh, thank you, hey, okay. I was like, not the dumbbell. Oh, this is oh, beautiful. Man. Thank you, thank guys. You, thank you. Hey, is it a kettlebell? <laughs> oh, yeah, same thing, yeah, same thing. Kettlebell. <laughs> same thing. Uh, sorry. Okay, words. <laughs> hey, is, is, is there someone that you can think of that would be ideal to come on the on the podcast? Anyone? It could be anyone. Wahine, man, whatever. Oh someone. my gosh, someone who would be great to come on the podcast. Damn, I should have thought about this, eh? Um, uh, do you mean as a woman? Yeah, or anybody, yeah, any, yeah anybody you, you can think of. Do, 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 do. I really would. I don't know if you've had her yet, but she's obviously from Christchurch. I would love for you to have Sarah Claire Brown, which is oh. Matteo Brown's wife. Oh, yes. If you want to have gold, if you want to, that is a woman who uh, I've been very much been inspired by. And you know, they do the whole, um, she is not your rehab. Yeah, yes. If you can get her on. I think awesome. she would be gold for you guys. Ooh. She is one woman of wisdom, and she is a person who loves words too. Wow. Um, but the movement that her and her, obviously her husband, have created has been such a beautiful thing, and I, yeah, I've been a big cheerleader for them and um, many others. But uh, she would be good. I honestly think she would be great awesome. on your show if you That's get her cool. on. Oh, Even man. her or Matt. Do yeah, you know what I mean? Yeah, Matt, yeah. Yes. So, yeah. But so cool. But that's a beautiful couple who are... Who that's what I talk about when you um, see a need, fulfill a need. And those two have been the epitome of that. Yeah. Oh, so oh, I would love if you could get those two on. Cool. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah, okay. that's mine. Yeah, my <laughs> love it. Agnes, we always give our guests the last word, please. Is there any last Ooh. words of wisdom or nuggets? Of, obviously, you've said countless nuggets or many nuggets this, this evening. But quote of all quotes. Yeah, yeah, yeah right? Anything, anything you want to oh. Somebody can put on my Instagram Insta- tonight. Absolutely. <laughs> and I just recently put it up, but it's one of those quotes that I, because of the struggle that I've come out of, right? When I saw this quote, and I can't, it's, so it's not mine, but it's one that I've just used. I think I, I use it as, I say, it's my mantra. Um, but it's because of the struggle and the hard times that I've come through and, and I just put it up on the last post that I've done on, on Facebook but I just want to encourage anyone out there like if you have gone through like shit you've gone through hard times you've gone through the struggle let me tell you this quote here a setback is a setup for an ultimate comeback Ooh. and that is what I want to leave with everyone is because Let's be honest, we've all been set back a couple of times in our lives, right? And we think that's it. But let me tell you, man, that's just, yeah, again, just the mean setup for the ultimate comeback that you have always ever wanted in your life. And so I believe that me and my children are on the comeback right now. And we're going to mm. keep being on the comeback. So that's my final word. Ooh, man, yeah. nice. Nah, nice. Model, model. <laughs> all the best. Thank you once again. Thank um, you. Thank you all the be- yeah, just all the best for your endeavours in 2023, but more so in, in Australia and ABC. Yeah. Go well and um, God bless you. Thank you, Maro Apito. Yeah, no. And as, once again, team, <laughs> refine. 
unlock and, and take, take charge, charge. mate. <laughs> Bendy. <laughs>